perfect timing. <laughs> okay, we are very happy to be here, uh, leading you into the next session of this conference uh, called Tour des Planètes. We would like to introduce ourselves. My name is Eva Hermanovic, and I work for the Communications in Resilience Bonn, mainly focusing on forest genetic resources. And we are yin and yang, as you see. We complement each other with Geshe. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my name is Gesche Schifferdecker. I'm also working for the EFI Bonn communications team. And before we start, I would like to share a very short personal story with you. It was my birthday yesterday, and I was, as always on my birthday, super depressed, drowning in self-pity. But the good thing about birthdays is the day after the birthday is actually usually a great day. So I am super happy that we are hosting this session here with you. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so the session is called Tour de Planète or Tour de la Planète. Uh, we had a little joke here with the typo that was in the printed program because we are an international organization, so we were undecided whether to use French or English, and that was the new term that was coined. Um, so we would like to take you on a journey around the globe to cover the different forests from the tropics through the Europe and the Mediterranean up to the north to the boreal forests. And the objective of the session is to understand if integrated forest management makes <laughs> sense and it where we are heading with it. Where we are heading with it and with this topic today. So and we have a so great panel have today. No, well before we we, you can you can this yes, yes I, um, before we invite the panelists uh, successively to the uh, to the um, chairs here, I would like to say something about uh, how we imagine the session. We will have five keynotes, um, each ten to fifteen maximum of twenty minutes, and if the keynotes get too long, I will raise it's supposed to be red but they only had pink, so I will raise the pink one, but I don't think we'll need it. After each presentation or speech, um, because not all of them are using um, the classical PowerPoint, um, we will have some time, maximum of five minutes, for reaction. We discussed before that to start a real Q&A wouldn't make sense, but we uh, will have uh, a longer um, time for discussion after the five keynotes, um, hopefully minimum of 40 minutes. If the keynotes are a bit shorter, we'll have more time. And um, we would then also like to encourage you as, in as the audience to, to contribute with questions. And uh, I wanted to show it, but I just realized that um, we... Maybe, Jose, do you have a second to come down? I want to show the... Um, I want to show the uh, hashtag. We just figured that we all suck with computers, so we don't know <laughs> how to show uh, the EFI Twitter account, because as uh, Georg already mentioned, we have a live stream today, which is starting right now. And we um, hopefully have uh, lots of people following the conference remotely via the live stream. And, um, these people are in, um, very invited to um, ask questions via the hashtag forest ecoservices, which you can see um, above here. Um, so we'll have a both interactive um, discussion after, after uh, the keynotes and also um, hopefully some input from um, people outside of this room. So with this, we would like to invite our distinguished keynote speakers here to the stage. Uh, so the first one is uh, Robert Nazi, and he's the Director General of C4 since 2017. Uh, since more than 35 years, he has been living and traveling extensively in Africa, Asia, and the Pacific, where he was undertaking research activities in the fields of ecology and management of tropical forests. So welcome, Robert. <laughs> yeah, you can. 
The second speaker is uh, Natalia Lukina. She is current, uh, currently the director of Center uh, for Forest Ecology and Productivity at the Russian Academy of Sciences in Moscow. And she is also a board member of European Forest Institute. Um, she works on forest ecology, biodiversity, ecosystem functions and services. And um, she has a record of more than 200 publications, including nine books, and we'll learn more later. <laughs> Next, we have Christian Messier. He's a professor of forest ecology and urban forestry and scientific director at Eastford Institut des Sciences et de la Forêt Tempérée at the University of Quebec in Canada. And in 2016, he was awarded the famous research prize of the Humboldt Foundation. Uh, I'm mentioning it because the foundation is based it's here based in Bonn. In Bonn. Um, but you were not based in Bonn, you were based in Freiburg then, no? Um, <laughs> he has also worked in Freiburg University on the resilience of managed forests to global change. The next keynote speaker is Ulrich Schrammel. Um, he has studied forestry, but he has never worked in the forest as a professional because he always showed more interest in people than in trees. He wrote two big books, that's what he shared with us, uh, one on hunters and one on uh, private forest owners. I learned during my time with EFI two very critical um, issues. Um, and after 20 years in academia, uh, he moved to a forest um, research uh, institute uh, specialized uh, in applied r uh, research um, to be closer to trees now and uh, also to people who work with trees and this institute he is now heading. Welcome. <laughs> and finally, I would like to invite Eduardo Rojas Briales, currently professor at the Department of Plant Production at the Polytechnical University of Valencia. And from 2010 to 2015, he was assistant director general and head of the forestry department at FAO. Uh, he has also several honorary appointments, among them being a member of the PFC International Board. Welcome. And I would like to add, it was also his birthday yesterday, so happy belated <laughs> birthday. <laughs> We're birthday buddies, yeah. Um, well, now um, we would start with the first presentation. Ah, uh, it's on already. Um, Robert Nazi, I'm not sure if you want to or co go to the uh, speaker's corner. Um, he will uh, speak uh, to us today about uh, how to manage uh, tropical forests in a sustainable way. And he is asking, as you can see, the provocative question, whether this is the uh, holy gray or the fool's rent. Robert, you have the floor. Thanks. I'm not sure I'm going to tell you how we can manage forest and or maybe uh, trying to explain why we didn't so far. Uh, <clears throat> I, and first, uh, first caveat, I mean, I thought, uh, either I can read my paper or I'll see you, because if I put my glasses, I cannot read my paper. So <clears throat> if you, I see some blurred people over there, I, I hope it will be okay. So if you ask a question later, you for, forgive me. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, this is only... Uh, I think uh, looking at the, the, the participant is very much a, a, a temperate boreal uh, uh, area. So it's probably the only uh, tropical uh, speech uh, he will uh, hear to. And I could dwell on for, for a long time on, on the status on what is happening in a tropical forest. But to make it short, I mean, it's, uh, the tropical forests are not in a good shape. Uh, this is the place on Earth where deforestation is increasing. Uh, contrary to some area in temperate forests and uh, still, I mean, a sort of a large part of the, the wood that is harvested in in uh, uh, tropical forests is is not for very noble use. It's, it's mainly for bioenergy and cooking and heating. Um, Eighty percent of the tropical forests that have disappeared have disappeared because of agriculture, be it shifting agriculture or uh, more like commodity-based, oil palm, or rubber, uh, cacao, coffee, you name it. 
<coughs> so overall, the, the, the situation of the tropical forest is, is, not, is not very good, and it's a pity because for, for several decades, and um, responsible for it, we have been talking about sustainably managing uh, tropical forest, about uh, integrated management of tropical forest, about multiple use of tropical forest. Uh, and um, we have tried this by many ways and a reductionist approach, uh, uh, trying to see can we apply a landscape approach, can we, I mean, fortunately, unfortunately, it didn't work really, I mean, sort of, and, and, and really have to, to ask ourselves the question, uh, why is it that uh, it, it didn't work? And, and uh, is it because of uh, technology? Is it because uh, we are applying models uh, developed in, in, in northern countries in, in tropical context? Uh, uh, how is it working? And to give you an idea, I mean, a sort of the, the, the historical approach has been to create a sort of what we have here. It's fundamentally a, a permanent forest domain that you will reserve for forestry and a place that we will leave for agriculture and, uh, and, and hoping that it will work. So this is Côte d'Ivoire. So there were more than 300 logging perimeter for a class in, established in the south of the eight parallel. Uh, and the idea was that we will sustainably manage that and uh, we will protect the forest on, on the north of the, this eight parallel to avoid the armatan to come down to the south. Results from 16 million hectares, we are down to 1 million. So they didn't work. Um, if you look at the, the, the small anchor on the right, it, it's a Cameroon, and uh, you see a forest management unit, uh, Unité Forestière de Management, uh, in pale yellow, and what you see in orange and, and green are in fact van de coupe, which is something that is allocated without any management, which is totally unsustainable, and, uh, and that you can see that they are slowly eating in the, in, in the permanent forest domain. So again, zoning didn't work. And then if you look only at the, at the forestry element, you miss a big problem. The map on, on the left is the mining and oil concession in the Congo Basin. So you can see that probably 75 or 80 percent of the area is under some form of existing concession for oil or minerals. So how can we uh, consider that we can manage this tropical forest. Another issue we have in tropical forests, it's related to it. Who owns this tropical forest? Because they have a tendency to say, oh, from far away, from looking from the satellite, this place looks empty and wild, and uh, they are not empty. There is quite a lot of people living there, and there is quite a lot of people that have been living there for a long time, and they have changed the forest, and they consider that they have rights on the forest, even if these rights are not necessarily recognized. Uh, if they are not legal, they are certainly legitimate. And, and then you have a problem uh, uh, if you forget these invisible people because they are doing some uh, artisanal logging, uh, they are transporting things across border by whatever reason, they are using charcoal. So fundamentally, you have a clash against the top typical uh, northern type of management, uh, management system proposed and the fact that what you are mainly dealing with is an informal system. In Cameroon, the official timber trade is about 1.5 cubic met 1.5 million cubic meter per year. The informal timber trade is about 2.5 million cubic meter per year. In DR Congo, the ratio is 1 to 10. You have 10 times more timber that goes out or wood that goes out on the informal sector than the formal sector. How do you manage that? Uh, how do you manage that in the context of a very young population, a very growing population? So there will be 900 million more people, or 500 million more people in Africa by 2050. Uh, how, how do you manage that? How do you manage the demand? Uh, these people, they want job. How do you convince them that your integrated forest management is better than business as usual? And, Investing on the long term is better than having food tomorrow on the on me. So, how do we deal with that? 
And to show you one, one of the issues, because it's something that we have been discussing quite a lot with uh, Mark Palai from EFI and this whole issue of the bioeconomy. And, and our main question with Mark is, okay, we want to have bio bias economy. So we want more wood, we want less concrete. I mean, then the, the done question is where this wood is going to come from. So is this what about primary forest, about 33%? Uh, naturally, naturally generated forest, which is the sort of the classical forest managed in, in the European system, uh, 60% and plantation 7%. And this thing produce uh, 4 billion cubic meter per year. Uh, <coughs> 4 billion uh, hectares, and then you see the, the production, it's about uh, uh, 3 point uh, something, so it's, it, it, it's about the same, so billion cubic meter. The interesting part is that wherever in the world, I mean, a sort of, be it in the tropic or not, someone uses about half a cubic meter per year. It's, it's, it works pretty well. So if you have 950 more million people by 2030, then, then where where this additional 450 million cubic meter will come from, and, and, and that's uh, the main issue. So, and, and that's an issue that is going to impact either you choose on the future, which is on the left, very little tree, or the f and a lot of people, or the future on the right, a lot of tree, but very few people. And, and, that's, and that's the problem we have. We, we need to reinvent uh, completely the way we look at integrated management and the way we approach uh, this issue, I, I, at least in, in, in the tropics. And I took the case here in the Congo Basin because that's the place that I know better, but it's very similar uh, in Southeast Asia and, and it's very similar in Latin America with some differences because of the composition of the forest and because of the development of the civil society or the recognition of uh, indigenous group or something like that. But so fundamentally, we need to find new approaches and, and they are not easy. We are trying some. Uh, and this is an example of uh, Yangambi. So for the tropical forest, uh, forester, Yangambi is a very special place. Uh, it was one of the biggest uh, research station uh, in the tropics, uh, uh, INEAC, l'Institut National d'Etudes en Afrique Centrale. And uh, there, there was a big conference in 1957 that were designed this sort of the classification of Yangambi. So it's a traditional place. Now it's, it's a place where, in fact, you have a mine and the biosphere reserve and you have 260,000 people around this mine and the biosphere reserve. And these people, they have nothing. No electricity, no health system, no schools, nothing. So what do you do in a situation like that? And how do you tell the people that, no, you should not go into the reserve because it's a protected area? So this whole approach that we need to have, and it's getting, it's quite complicated and it goes way beyond the sort of the forester. I've been trained uh, like you as a temperate forester, but it, it goes way beyond, I mean, it's sort of, you have to look at teaching the, the, the young in the school. And where you see it's that the teacher is someone that we train. I mean, we establish a program for master, PhD there. So he's one of our master students uh, making environmental, environmental education in the school. Well, you need some research. This one is an elder for the, for the silvicultural geeks. It's a, this, this, an elder dispositive in, in, in the forest where you see different type of intensity for Aphromosia, which is the, the main logging timber species there. Uh, we are developing some sort of a fisheries uh, association with women so that they can stay related to the forest, have an income, but not go back in the forest into just to, to collect things or to harvest or to... And at the same time, we are uh, trying uh, uh, on, on, the, on the right, you see, is, okay, can we provide electricity to these people using biomass? And it's a big topical issue, and, but fundamentally, uh, we are using areas that are degraded to plant fast-growing timber species, acacia, exotic, something that people don't like in general, to feed uh, a, a biomass uh, and eat uh, energy plant that will provide electricity to these people. Because if you provide electricity, then you start to develop an economical viability. People can dry their fish. People can process their harvest instead of losing 50 or 60% post-harvest. 
and then you create something and then you can tell to the people, okay, now you have some way of living. It's part of the forest. You still can go to the forest to collect non-timber forest species, but please don't kill the chimpanzee or the okapis or don't do in sustainable logging. So I think it's the future for tropical forest. This is the result now of something like 12 years of investment. We probably need to stay there 15 more years. So anything that is based on a project that will start for one year and finish in three years is not going to work. So thank you very much. It was 12 minutes. Thank you very much, Robert, for this fascinating presentation. I would like to ask you to stay here because we are going to just have a, a few minutes for clarification questions or any immediate feedback. We are not going into a very deep discussion now because we will have the time at the end for more profound uh, discussion. But if you have any immediate questions to Robert, this is the time to ask them. Uh, I have to add that, unfortunately, we do not have uh, enough microphones, so it'll be a little bit of running, but uh, we'll manage. <laughs> Thank you very <laughs> much. Patient. My name is Richard Fischer, coming from Thunen Institute Federal Research in Hamburg, Germany. Um, thank you for the very nice presentation and the perspective that we foresters need to move out of the classical forests. The point is now we are entering into what I would call classical development cooperation. And if I ask GIZ or other um, development agencies, I mean, this is what they do since uh, decades of years, integrate the development with education, with income alternatives and so on. So the only, so to say, new thing is that we foresters have to realize that we have to go out of the forests. Need the mic. So maybe we yeah. keep one mic here. Yeah, uh, I don't know if Sven is in the room because yeah, he's over there. I mean, a sort of this thing that to, to lift people out of poverty, you have to take them out of the forest. Uh, maybe, yes or not? Um, the, the debate remains open. The fact is, I mean, a sort of, and something that is largely ignored by people, I mean, a sort of, you can produce quite a lot of wood on agricultural land. It's just a matter of changing the way you do agriculture. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's a problem that is true for Europe also, uh, uh, but particularly in, in, in this area. If you look at Côte d'Ivoire, I mean, they are left with one million hectares of forest, but in fact, they are still exporting timber. 85% or 90% of the timber that is exported from Côte d'Ivoire comes from agricultural land. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions or immediate feedback? No, so we can move on to the next presentation. Um, the next speaker is Natalia, and Natalia will speak about Eurasian boreal forests today and how they can be governed and managed to provide multiple services. And I have one, um, one request. Um, if the speakers could yep. stay at the, at the panel after because we have to struggle with the microphones, so if you could just stay for questions after your, after your speech, that would be great. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Dear colleagues, first, first of all, yes, I would like to thank the organizers of, me, of the meeting for invitation uh, to give this our presentation about Eurasian boreal forest and ecosystem services. Yes. Boreal forests. Boreal forests are forests which are growing uh, in high latitude environments, uh, represent about 30% of global forest area, and 30, more than 30% of these forests are growing on permafrost. Uh, more than half of boreal forests are located in Russia, and around six. Uh, uh, percent in Scandinavia. And Russia and Sweden are major uh, forest producing countries in Eurasia and we apply a cross country comparative approach to explore the significance of the different forest management approaches for, uh, for the capacity to deliver forest ecosystem services. General information 
very shortly about our forest, Russian forest, area of forest more than 1,179 million hectares, and in forest fund, area covered by forest is 768 million hectares. Uh, the major goal of forestry is to provide wood while uh, maintaining uh, environment protection ecosystem functions. Extensive forestry model is applied in Russia, except for some regions. State ownership, only 0.1% of municipal ownership. And uh, the share list forest is 22, and they list mainly for wood provision. As for the world export, about 14% around wood and some timber about 11 percent. As for Swedish forest, 23 million hectares of forest land, land. it is more than 57 percent of land area. Main goal to provide wood biomass while maintaining biodiversity and also consider other interests. More than 8 percent of world paper export and more than 10 percent of world on timber. Intensive silviculture model is applied, and 50% private individual owners and 22% privately owned limited companies. This is vegetation cover of Russia. Forest cover is 85 here. And very short, you can see in green uh, deciduous forest, in violet spruce, in orange pine, and in brown large, you can see in the Asian part, it is on permafrost. Uh, I should say that forest cover, boreal forest cover is changing very quickly. You can see here, for example, it is forest cover of 2000, but 50 years before, you can see here, you, you can find here dark coniferous forest and pine forest. But to 2000, uh, very, uh, yes, very large area, you can see at very large area, coniferous forests were replaced by deciduous forests. And also forest growing in abandoned agricultural lands, you can see. It is about 60 million hectares now. Yes. And unfortunately, over the past 10 years, according to the data of Space Research Institute, we have lost 1.2 million hectares per year forest cover. I mean. Yes? Sorry. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes, as for Swedish forest, you can see here forest from Nemeral to North Boreal. And the development of Swedish forest since, uh, since uh, 1930, stand volume increasing, annual cut and increment increasing, and area, but area of all growth forest decreasing. Yes, and uh, we try to answer four main questions of our conference. First question is, what concepts exist at policy and practical management level to deal with ecosystem services synergies and trade-offs? In Russia, you can see sustainable forest management, which means sustainable forest use. Multiple-use forestry, forest can be used for various purposes. Extensive forestry model, as I already said, uh, is applied and zoning of forest area for intended purposes I will show later on. And in Sweden, sustainable forest management, which means sustainable forest growth while achieving environmental objectives. Multiple use forestry, which means use multiple use of forest resources for job and sustainable growth. And the Swedish forestry model, which means high wood production while maintaining, maintaining environmental conditions and the freedom with responsibility. The second question is, to what extent are integrated concepts implemented and what facilitates and constraints in terms of segregation integration debate? 
it is a comparable table. Implementation of <coughs> sustainable forest management in Sweden and Russia. In Sweden, multiple use on 90% of forest area and protection on about uh, 9%. In Russia, multiple use in managed forest because we have unmanaged forest also. We have different intended purposes. It is 78% of the area. Strength in uh, Sweden, broad problem formulation, high degree of policy integration. In Russia, zoning to ensure delivery of different forest ecosystem services and to safeguard biodiversity. Weakness in Sweden, weak instrument to make trade-offs like in Russia also. High reliance on voluntary instruments and implementation deficit. In Russia, weak integration, weak instrument to make, <coughs> to make trade-offs, and wood mining and very low level of silviculture. And I should say also about trend for substitution of, of forestry itself by legal regulation of all processes, including technological processes at the local, at the local level from the center. This is segregation zoning of forest area in Russia. You can see here eight federal districts, and we have three uh, zones, protective forest, where priority is protection of water, soil environment protection. But other type of use also are allowed. Operational forest in orange, it is, uh, in this case, priority is wood provision, and but all other types of use also are allowed. And unmanaged so-called reserve forest, it is in, uh, in uh, Siberia and Far East, you can see. Yes, and what should I say about this segregation and integra integration uh, debates? We think, that, uh, we think that this division is very conventional because very shortly, if you, you, you can see here hierarchy of forestry or forest management units in Russia. Uh, forestry allotment, it is elementary forestry unit. Here we have clear segregation according to legislation because in this case uh, you, you can have only one type of forest use, for instance, wood or recreation. Yes, but when you combine this forestry allotment to forestry quota, already you have integration because you have different type of uses. And then uh, high in so-called listenitistva also integration. And then uh, uh, when, we, <coughs> when we on the highest level forest area, of course we have segregation accordingly intended purposes, but if we combine this forest area from different parts, we have, we have some kind of integration. Of course we have uh, some priorities on, on, on these areas, uh, uh, I mean uh, on operational, on protective areas. We have some uh, priority, but uh, we have opportunity to have all types of uses in this forest. And even if we have elementary forest, forestry units, we understand that here we also have ecological forest ecosystem services. They are not in legislation, but in nature they are existing. But we don't take uh, into account them. And uh, we need a multi-criterial multi -criterial assessment based on uh, evaluation of numerous forest ecosystem services parameters, uh, uh, assessment of political and forestry scenarios to, to deliver a broad range of forest ecosystem services. But uh, uh, problem, we have problem for taking into account ecological forest ecosystem services because Administrative management units I, show, I have shown do not coincide with natural units. For instance, forest catchment for uh, water runoff, it is impossible to take into account water runoff when you are on elementary units. Or migration ways of pea forest animal species or life activity of ecosystem engineers like beaver. 
Yes, and integration of forest ecosystem services related policies in Sweden and Russia. In Sweden, climate, energy, forest, and conservation objectives highly integrated. In Russia, weak links between these policies. Environmental consideration is not in priority in Sweden and in Russia also, in Russia except for protective forests. Uh, in Sweden, strong synergies between climate mitigation, renewable energy and wood production. In Russia, forest ecosystem services related climate and energy policy, policy weakly developed. In Sweden, integrated forest management strategy and in Russia, segregated uh, forest management strategy if we, we based on this uh, zoning approach. In Sweden, prioritization on wood production on more than 90% of forest area in Russia, 55%, 57%. Third question, what do we know about integration segregation outcomes in terms of providing ecosystem services conserving biodiversity? What about outcomes? Sweden. Wood biomass uh, production very high, effective. In Russia, wood mining increase, unfortunately. Uh, in Sweden, biodiversity under threat, negative trend. In, in Russia, uh, we have conservation due, due to segregation. We have three, three points, but I, I am short of time to discuss this, maybe later on. But, uh, of course, there is a threat with wood mining, which is increasing, as I said and in large-scale disasters. I mean, forest fires in Siberia, you know, of course, and very, very important now, permafrost though in Siberia, in very big area. And accordingly, uh, yes, in uh, Sweden, recreation and subsistence mix what many negative effects and also shrinking areas for areas, also negative trends. In, and for Russia, according to regulation, ecological forest ecosystem services only in protective forests, if we take into account legal regulation now. And recreation now is under development. And last question, what are the trends for the future? Uh, it is accordingly our modeling exercises. In Sweden, uh, uh, Scenarios in a selected landscape, uh, 30,000 uh, hectares in northern Sweden, and these scenarios for 100 years. Current management business as usual, net re revenues, harvested volume, dead wood increase, but old broadleaf forest and recreational forest decrease, significantly decrease, and the area of old growth forest remain on a very low level. About 10% as I remember. More, uh, if, uh, we, if we have scenarios with more intensive management, higher har harvesting uh, levels and net revenue, but at the expense of all broadleaf and recreational forests, that decrease even more when in first case. And the area of all growth forest remain on a very low level. But in last case, when we have stronger environmental consideration, it is possible to increase the area of old growth, broadleaf, and recreational forest substantially with different management methods. And as for carbon stock, carbon stock is increasing in all cases, but in the last case, is increasing higher than in other scenarios. In Russia, uh, we had this uh, modeling on different uh, spatial levels. On federal level, in the scenarios with different forestry regime, for the next, uh, for the next 100 years, we have a modern level of large-scale disturbances we have now, the carbon balance will decrease, and those making forest ecosystem uh, a carbon source in some federal districts. On the landscape level, uh, landscapes with coniferous and broadleaf coniferous forests in the scenarios of forestry regime and we focus on the environment, eliminating major disturbances, the biodiversity rank and carbon accumulation rate will increase with forest ecosystem being a carbon sink. And while harvested uh, 
uh, volume will vary remarkably, but remain at a stable level. And there are many uncertainties in assessing uh, the effects of permafrost law on forest functioning, including the carbon cycle. I mean, Siberia. And to conclude, sustainable forest management concept may imply very different things within the boreal region. Integrative strategies do not necessarily result in balance between the forest ecosystem services. Segregation strategies may be needed to safeguard biodiversity and broad range of forest ecosystem services. Wood mining model must be replaced by forest growing model, wood mining in, forest, uh, in Russia, I mean. Boreal forests are under increasing pressure, climate change and increasing demand for forest ecosystem services, and how to set priorities and how to strengthen synergy and make trade-offs are key. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Natalia. Thank you also for staying here. Um, now I would like to give room for, first of all, I would like to ask you, do you want to drink something? Because we're actually planning that the panelists would sit here, but then they, after our introduction, they all went back to their seats. It's fine, but in case you want to drink something, please feel free to, to serve yourself. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yes, so the room is open uh, for question. It was a lot of information. It was also very interesting to see the comparison between Sweden and Russia. Um, I'm looking to the audience. I is also impressed. There is one question. Yes. Hi. Uh, just wondering, what are you seeing uh, in the permafrost areas? Uh, how the forests are changing, uh, new species or... Which forest? Could you go back to that? Thank you very much. Can you, can you, uh, yes, can you repeat, yes? Uh, yeah, just wondering what, what you're seeing in the permafrost areas, a change of species or faster growth rates? Uh, what? Yes, yes. As for these forests on permafrost, now we can see that productivity is increasing. We have these remarks, of course, but maybe you know that we have large-scale disturbances in Siberia, I mean large-scale fires. If we have these fires for permafrost uh, doing, it, is, it means uh, accelerating rate of doing because forests are protecting permafrost. And in this case, it is big threat. I mean, for uh, carbon emissions and so on. But if we say about forest on undisturbed, uh, undisturbed permafrost, yes, productivity of this forest is increasing now. There are evidence for that, evidences. Mm -hmm. Any further questions or remarks? Yeah, Georg, sure. please wait uh, until the mic is coming. Perhaps it's too early to ask, but if I compare your presentation with the previous presentation, so perhaps it's better for later. So the previous was very much about local people and what they want to do, and yours was very much comes a policy topic in Russia, or is it more for specialists thinking about these huge forests that are bigger than everything in Europe combined? So yes. is, are people engaged? Are there like environmental discussions, forest use discussions, or is it rather the specialists dealing with it? Unfortunately, I cannot say that uh, local people are engaged uh, very deeply. Uh, it is discussion uh, 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 in our scientific, scientific uh, on our scientific platform and dis our discussion with our politicians about this. But now, of course, uh, local people are more and more interested in question of forest in Siberia, for instance, when we have these large-scale fires, uh, and of course it was already questions of health of local people. It was very big uh, discussion about forest, about fires, about management, about management of forest, and how to, to do the best, 
how to manage this forest. Local people were interested very much. And of course, also if we take Moscow region, if, uh, if officials they make a decision, for instance, to cut forest close to houses, home, <laughs> yes, in this case also hot discussion. But if we say about the whole Russian uh, forest, about the management, about governance, I cannot say now that local people are engaged. Yes, it is not good, but we do, now we do very, very many things to involve in discussion. We have in Russian Academy of Science, we organize special uh, platform for debates of all hot issues in forestry. And very many people in region also, in regions, from regions also, they try to take participations, partic participation in these debates, even in, for instance, on Skype also, yes. And we can notice the growing interest, yes. But as I can compare, for instance, to Sweden or to Germany, no, we have no so higher social activity, no. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, then I would like to introduce the next speaker. Yes, please feel free to uh, serve yourself some more water. Uh, the next speaker is Christian. Um, and uh, we've already um, touched upon um, forest disturbances and um, a growing interest in forests when um, we are facing uh, forest disturbances caused by climate change and other reasons. And Christian will um, now uh, talk about uh, large public forests in um, Australia, the US and Canada, um, prone to disturbances. So we will, uh, we will uh, take the topic up again. And uh, he says, um, Christian says that we need new approaches um, because the systems are very complex. So I'm uh, very curious and I think we are all very curious to learn uh, more about what he will propose. Thank you very much, Christian. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, of course, this is a big challenge to talk about three countries and a new approach in less than 20 minutes. But there's a bit of an irony for me being here because when you invited me, you said you wanted me to cover the English-speaking world, but I am a French-speaking person, so that's, <laughs> <clears throat> that's good. I like that. I mean, I'm very happy about this. So let's, uh, let's move on. I actually, there's two big topics I want <coughs> to talk about is really, I will be very quickly comparing US, Australia, and Canada. And you will see there are some similarities, but there are some major differences. Unfortunately, Klaus is here and he, he can maybe, uh, and I have to go back because actually I, I had some help from Ron Nikinen, who is a good friend of mine. We studied, uh, our, we did our PhD together in Vancouver. And Ron Nikinen also, who is uh, um, where we have been, you know, making a lot of, uh, uh, what would I say, uh, to be polite, um, outrageous statement in the last few years. But so it's, we are sharing the blame for this. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, start Australia. I mean, Australia is a big country, but it's, it's good to know that the forest covers only 16% of the area, but it still has around 130 a million hectare of forest. 98% is native forest, 2% is plantations. And it's really divided between a lot of what they, in Australia they call leasehold. So this is big areas that are leased for production. There's some private forests. 8% around public multiple use, 7% other public land, and 32% protected areas. And I'll come back to this. Uh, lots of pressure from the public to increase uh, protected areas, and I even heard some people blaming some of the big fires because there was too much protected areas and not enough management in these forests. So that's a big an issue there. And 36% of the uh, forest approximately is available for wood production. A bit like Canada, until maybe the 1990, uh, forestry was a bit unregulated, but starting here in 1992, they had this, what they called the NFPS, National Forest Policy Statement, which created some kind of guideline. And of course, the main idea was, of course, to 
extract timber, but also to provide other services. I mean, this is when it, it really started. So they had an ecological sustainable development working group. They had a plantation adv advisory group. This is where plantation really took off, and there was some resource assessment. And they really tried to, in this um, uh, national forest policy statement, try to identify ways to accom accommodate different uses. And they are still trying to find ways to accommodate uses, as you can imagine, and if you follow the news. And, and Australia is a bit like Canada and uh, maybe in the US, but it's divided in different uh, states or provinces. So they have in some of these states what they call these regional forest agreements, which address different forest values, which try to balance, and I always say try to balance between industry development and conservation, and also try to engage in public strat strategy planning. But when I talk with um, Ronnie, he told me that the, it's still very difficult for, for the public to get involved because it's very complex and they don't really feel they, they have enough knowledge to get involved. And I will tell you that it's exactly the same in Canada. So they evaluate the cost and the benefit for different uh, value. And one of the main thing about these uh, regional forest agreement was actually to provide some certainty about resource development so that companies could even borrow money to develop mills, etc. So what was the outcome so far? So 15% of the forest is in conservation area. Lots of old growth is being conserved and there's a lot of pressure. Every day there's people wanting more uh, old growth forest to be pro protected. So there is a significant protection of the wilderness, the cultural and other values and provision for uh, threatened species and habitat. This is actually at the core of a lot of the conflict and discussion in Australia is to protect threatened species. And they also they have a special fund to develop these plantations because you will see most of the timber now in Australia come from these plantations, not from these uh, native forests. So I know it's not fair, but this is uh, what I have to say about Australia. So Canada is a big country, but the dark green is actually where we do forestry. So there's a lot of forest, but a lot of the forest is actually non-productive enough or too far away, so we don't really do any forestry. This kind of figure, there's a lot of information, but just wanted to tell you that around 90% of the forest in Canada is, is public, 6% private, around 2% federal, and maybe 1% under some kind of aboriginal uh, management. And we're talking about 350 hectare, uh, 250 million hectare forest, and big disturbances. Like in, a, in a Russia, uh, around 4% of the forest is being affected by insect outbreak, around 1% by fire, and only less than half percent by forest cutting. But this adds up to actually quite a bit of disturbance. This figure is very the, the interesting and a bit alarming for us. Uh, we are now starting to calculate the outcome of forestry operation and forestry disturbance on the net carbon emission. And until around 2000, we felt the forest was absorbing carbon, but since then it's actually releasing carbon and more and more. And there are two reasons, big insect epidemics and increased fire also in the forest. So we are now Actually, the forest is now emitting carbon. So we are now contributing to the carbon increase in the atmosphere with the forest. And of course, we might think that this will be reversed in the future when this forest will start to regrow. But the prediction is that there will be more and more fires and insect outbreak. Um, just to show you here, uh, when we do an assessment of the practices, we talk about multi multiple values. And this is kind of a separated between protect, uh, production, multiple values, and social and cultural benefits. And one thing that I always say is that actually when we plant forestry in Canada, we plant for timber production and all the other values are constrained. Biodiversity is a constraint, water is a constraint, recreation is a constraint. It's never really managed as a value per se, but as a constraint. 
Um, very quickly, tell you that the harvesting is, as I mentioned, mainly in publicly owned forests. It's mainly done by very large private companies. Uh, they have to have a license or a timber supply agreement. So the word says it, they manage under a timber supply agreement. And this is actually under the provincial jurisdiction. So each province uh, has these kind of uh, license and agreement. And they impose some requirement. And it's, it, it changes regularly, but there's more and more now requirement about protecting biodiversity, protecting other values. But again, it's not really uh, an objective per se, it's a constraint. And a lot of the regulations are by constraint. And since the last 10 years or 15 years, a big change in Canada is that we are now managing under what we call an ecosystem based management approach. And in Canada, what it means is we try to understand how natural disturbances are affecting the forest dynamics. And we have developed forestry practices that emulate this. So we're trying to recreate the disturbance of the natural disturbance when we do the logging. So we feel that this will protect the habitats, the biodiversity. So this is actually very important. So I think I mentioned this. I think I will go quickly uh, on this. But biodiversity and other values are regulated. They are not planned. They are not evaluated. We don't assess what is the value of the water, what is the value of the carbon, but it's always a regulation. So maybe some pictures above, you see the old practices, big clear cuts. Uh, actually, I was in Belgium uh, just before coming here, and there was a big clear cut, and they told me they called it the Canada clear cut. Uh, <laughs> that was interesting. And below, what you see is variable retention and partial cutting in the boreal forest, and this is starting to increase. It's based on this emulating natural disturbance. We are doing m a bit more than before, but it's still less than 20% of the landscape. Most of the landscape is still clear cutting. And of course, I don't want to forget about the deciduous forest. This is where I, I live and I, I grew up, but this is mainly harvested using the selective cuttings. And the main reason is for social reason. People live in these forests, they don't want to see clear cut, so the clear cut is banned and it's mainly uh, selective logging. Let's go to the USA. I think the USA is the most interesting uh, country because it, uh, if, I, if I summarize, and this is from uh, what Klaus told me, this is the whole discussion about values and use is really now being segregated, segregated between the state forest, the federal forest, and the private forest. And as you will see at the end, it's, these discussions are almost made by conflict in the court. And it's a... It's actually a fairly interesting story. So you see the, the US, you see where the forest is. Actually, the, the federal forest, the public forest, is more in the west. In the east, because of the long history of human development, it's mainly private forest. Um, and Klaus is biased. He lives in Oregon, so he gave me some uh, example from Oregon. But Oregon is actually a good example, I think, of what's happening in the US. You see. On the on the this side of the the, you see that before uh, there was actually most of the forest was being managed under some kind of multiple use, but since 1996, you can see the division in the landscape. Lots of different division based on a lot of pressure from the public to protect biodiversity, mainly spotted owl, and actually most of the harvest now is actually coming from private forests that are managed very, very intensively. So the segregation is occurring based on public pressure and based on who owns the land. And I think it's well portrayed here with this uh, triangle uh, where you have social value, ecological value, and economic value. And I put the triad approach because I will talk if I have time. Yeah. But actually, just to show you, just show you how the segregation eight is. Eight minutes. It's done. Okay. How the segregation is done between the federal states and private. Private, mainly forest value, timber value, nothing else. States a bit in between, and federal is now mainly protected forest. <clears throat> of course, I wanted to uh, leave me some time about uh, the triad. I've been developing a triad for a lot of years, and also try to marry the triad and the comp complex, functional complex network approach. 
And I will try to convince in a few minutes that this might be actually an, a neat idea to not just try to um, reconcile the different values that we have, but also integrate what I will call global change. We, I hear a lot about climate change, and I, I know we, we hear a lot about climate change, but to me, the problem of the future is more than climate change, it's global change. Think about insects and disease and development of, of the human population. Th this is actually driving the, what's happening in the forest. So I don't know if you know about the triad approach, but this is an approach that was proposed by Seymour Hunter in 1992. And the idea was basically that if we want to maintain timber production and we want to increase protected areas and reduce the amount of timber we harvest in a big chunk of the forest to provide other values, we may want actually to put a small portion of the land where we do very, very intensive forestry. So this is... Uh, the idea, and this is what I just said here. And it actually, as far as I know, not really applied in a very large scale anywhere in the world, except now in Quebec since nine, 2013. It's part of the law, and I'm guilty of this. But of course, I've been looking at what's happening in the last seven years. This is in the law, but I mean, the implementation is very timid. I mean, they are very proud to say that they are doing tri triad, but I think it's more like we continue like before. But anyway, but I, wa I, wanted to, I want to convince you that triad might be a good idea, and I've done a lot of work, we've written papers to see that the triad might be the best way to reconcile different values. But because I think the forest is being um, threatened by a lot of different stress, climate change, of course, drought, but insects and disease, we also need to think and uh, develop a forestry practices to help adaptation of the forest and the complex the functional complex network approach might be a, a way to combine the two approach. It's based on increasing functional diversity of the forest and the functional connectivity, which means having f stands where the, the seeds from different uh, species could disperse from one to the other so that if a forest is disturbed, uh, the forest will be able to recover from species that are not affected nearby. So th this is the idea here and we wrote a paper uh, last, that was published last, last year. If you're interested, I can send you the paper. But when I put the triad, this is how I integrated the two approach. You have three areas, a conservation area that is required and needed for conservation purposes, an extensive area where you want to do a bit of forestry but also try to reconcile a lot of the other values, and then the intensive where you, you produce a lot of a lot of timber, but the idea with the functional network approach is that since many of our forests are composed of species that are maladapted to the new conditions or the future condition, we need to introduce new species that are better adapted, and we could do that in the intensive part of the forestry by locating these intensive plantations strategically in the landscape. They could become a source to disperse and actually maybe help forests recover if they are disturbed. Same thing in the extensive, where we do less forestry practices, but we could do what I call enrichment planting with key species, which has maybe new traits of species that are better adapted to the future conditions. So very quickly, and I will finish with a, a bit of a summary about the, the three countries and I won't read all of this, but I will say in Canada, we try to do this reconciliation of values by regulation at the provincial level. Certification is very big. We, most of our forest is actually FSC certified, which bring a lot of uh, constraint. Some conflict, mainly in the West, and a lot of voluntary practices in the small forest land, because in Canada, most of the small forest lands, we don't actually harvest a lot of timber. Uh, there was some survey of the private owners, and 70% of them says, my forest, the most important thing for me is recreation and biodiversity, not timber harvesting. In Australia, it's a bit different. I think they have now a segregation of the land. They have also some conflict, some certification, and voluntary practices. So you see the order is a bit different. And then in the U.S., I think the... Uh, protection of these different values is mainly by conflict. 
you know that forest companies tried to go and, and harvest in the public forest and then some uh, uh, private organization go to court and stop them to do this and so the forest is not being harvested and being protected because of these conflict. And because of that, it has actually created what I, I call a forced segregation of the land, which is kind of a triad, but the problem with the segregation is not planned. Yeah, I'm done. It's not planned. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Christian, you actually had two minutes left. Uh, I showed you the, I showed you the, the right. yellow one and the okay, doesn't I'll matter. I'll show you matter. my last picture then. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much for this presentation. And I would like to invite the audience to um, share any feedback or questions that you may have right now. Yes, please. Thank you for the presentation. When you are talking about um, the new traits potentially in the very intense managed forest, would it be about GM trees? No, 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 no. I'm talking about and not crisp trees. No, no. They could be totally natural uh, species. They are not, uh, but they are species that have some trait. Let's say uh, wood density, rooting depth, whatever traits that affect the function of the species that will that will make the forest around more resilient to potential disturbances. So we have an approach where we look at what are the diversity of traits that you have in the forest, which traits are missing, and then you can look at species to introduce in the landscape so that you have a greater diversity of functional traits. And in a way, and you may have seen, I went quickly, and this is appropriate today, but in a way, by planting species with different traits, you vaccinate your forest against disturbances. Very nice. Um, working for Forest Genetic Resources, the U14 program, I will keep this in my communication toolkit. Okay. <laughs> uh, any other feedback from the audience? Yes, please. If you can also uh, very briefly introduce yourself. Davide Petanella, University of Padova. Thanks for the, Christian, for the presentation. Only one question related to this uh, opposite approach that you mentioned. Uh, uh, constrain against values. From my perception, when we have values, we may introduce constraint. So there is no much opposition, but maybe I'm not fully understood your uh, point. Okay, what I mean is most of the plan is about how to harvest timber, how to maximize timber production. There is no value for carbon, water, recreation, or even biodiversity, there's no ways that we evaluate one of the other. We maximize timber production, and if we don't have constraint, we will put more. But the government say, well, we, we should do something about water, we should do something about maybe some people doing snowmobile, and they want some, some nice forest. So, but it's always a constraint. It's not part of a, I will call it, uh, it's not on the same footing. At the end, you may have actually a different values that are being considered, but it's just based on constraint. I don't, know if, I don't know if I'm clear, but I will much prefer that these values being evaluated, and then there's a, some kind of integrated decision about how do you make the maximum out of them. But usually, we calculate timber, and the rest is our constraint. We will take two questions from this side now. Okay, thank and you. And just two last questions. So this is Josep Spelta from Barcelona. And you know, I am a believer of your uh, thoughts of increasing functional diversity in forests. But my question is I, how... I don't like when people say you are a believer, but that's another... <laughs> okay. <laughs> we can discuss later. But uh, my question is how you can reconciliate this with the interests of the industries because they, they will be interested in one, two, three species. But so we need to invest more in the industry so they can use other species for the same purpose, or what is the, the trick? <clears throat> I will say what I, I will say, and maybe I will be, there will be a lot of people coming, but I think the industry has to adapt. And I have a hard time thinking that today you should plant a species that will become mature in 70 years and saying that this will be the species we will be using 
in 70 years or we will have the same industry. I don't think this should be a priority right now. That's what I say. I mean, we should manage to increase the resilience, the multiple use, and the only thing that the industry wants in Canada is they want to assure to have timber for the next 20 years. And that's okay, we, we can do this. But after that, they might close and go somewhere else. They do that all the time. So I don't think that we should plant a tree for them to say that in 70 years, this species should be available. I think we need to change that. This is, this is an obsolete concept to me. Okay, please, uh, one last question. <coughs> yes, uh, Bo Larsen from uh, University of Copenhagen. Um, you have now presented to us uh, your concept aim. Uh, in showing, two minutes. Yes, but that's fa anyway. fantastic. <laughs> showing uh, how it could be used in three countries which are, have a very new history in terms of forest management, at least active forest management. New countries, maybe only two, three hundred years. Do you think you can apply these ideas in Europe where we have managed our forests in a multiple way over four or five thousand years? You uh, have of, only of course, one Of course minute. I believe so and we actually have a project with uh, some colleagues in Belgium where we will compare the approach in Quebec and in Belgium. And of course it, there will be differences, but I think the concept could apply in both cases very well. Okay, thank you thank very you. much um, for now. Uh, and at this point, I would like to invite Ulrich Schlaml uh, to the stage. And in the title of his presentation, he has, nobody has any intention of building a wall, which uh, refers to the German history, of course. And uh, uh, Uli will talk about uh, integrated forest management in theory and in practice. So welcome mm. to the stage. The floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I will start with the practice. <laughs> Continue later with the theory then. And I think I will get a pointer that makes the, the running. Does it? Aha. <laughs> okay, that we we will. Mm. Okay, nobody has the, any intention of building a wall. So I was invited to talk about integrative um, forest management, and I was thinking about a metaphor that may help me and may help my audience. Uh, to carry through this um, presentation. Super. So everything is fine now. And um, well, you may decide whether this works or not. So let's start with the, um, with the wall. So what is a wall about? So one is, if you think about German history, you may start that wall construction often starts with a lie. But in fact, if you know the German history, uh, there was some um, pressure to build a wall. Walls have a quite ambivalent uh, character. It depends very much on which side you are, how you are separated, uh, whether they help as a peaceful uh, instrument or whether they avoid that people uh, go to the other side. And the other thing is, um, we just had a celebration last year and we were very happy that we came over this period of having the wall now for at least one generation. But anyhow, if you look around in the world, you will find that walls are getting quite popular. And this is true for the walls made of concrete, and this is true for the walls that somehow are in our heads. So what can it, has it to do with um, forestry? So I will start a bit with um, forest history, and um, if you look at this picture, I think it's maybe from the 1930s or something like that. It shows some German uh, forest enterprise uh, people, and as you can see, German forestry has never been gender balanced, so there is quite a 
a special situation that you see uh, within uh, these days. If we jump in the, in the present time, and that's what we do quite often if we like to educate people to come in contact with people, we offer them this kind of walls, we offer them different elements of a forest and invite them. What is your, I, please describe what is your ideal forest and in general these people, they do not paint a segregated world, but they paint an integrated world of their forest. So a classical example would this one be on the right, you will find at least everything. So there are people who enjoy the forest, there are people who work there, there are the animals, there are also some trees and even some foresters can be found and sometimes it's not quite clear who eats whom within these pictures. So if you <laughs> zoom into the picture, uh, so people have a lot of fun uh, with this kind of um, integrating different uses in their ideal uh, forest. In fact, um, the professional foresters did not always follow this uh, approach. And if we go back to the, the starting point of an evidence-based forest management, it was more a, a deintegration that was uh, typical. Because people, they analyzed what are the problems. They found out that complex property rights, complex um, um, using regimes that a majority of different uh, objectives, objectives have been uh, the problem to sustain the forest. And so the quite simply solution is everything that is a competitor can be, no, let's, let's keep the trees in, but take out the meadows and the animals and those people who take the litter those who just enjoy, take out the deer, maybe not. <laughs> the deer, we take out the deer, so that's what my slide says. We take at least out uh, parts of the uh, deer. Quite an easy game, what I'm uh, doing now at the moment. Maybe the problem is that I do not take out the practices alone, but I also put out all the stakeholders that are now in my box. I put out all the values these people somehow rely on. I put out all the possibilities of these people somehow to influence my system. Anyhow, some people succeeded and unfortunately um, also the, the gender situation changed somehow. So those people who are now proud about forests that are somehow stable, that are productive, uh, that are um, characterized with a continuous forestry, are mainly managed um, by men, and they mainly follow this expert approach that has, of course, some advantages, but also some disadvantages, and I will come up with this. So the advantages are described with this slide here. So the productivity of this forest is clear, uh, the sustainable yield is always proved and even some of the pictures are really nice pictures so they really were able to produce beautiful forests throughout Central Europe. Anyhow, some people missed something, though they missed some possibilities for recreation, they missed some old trees, so within the last decades we learned that the reintegration of some of these elements may be a useful approach, so integrative forest management became a popular tool. Retention forestry was already described during the presentation of Jürgen, uh, for example. So we put some of the things back, maybe a bit more of the deer, as you suggested. In fact, they have never been away, so anyhow, some more deer now in our uh, system. And the critical thing now is what's happening here. So there may be two levels of investigation and two things that are of interest. The one thing is the result. So I have a picture now, nice, integrated, but there are also people who make these decisions. What is reintegrated, when, and who can make this kind of decisions? And it seems that these two questions what is the result and who does it have been 
evaluated during the last decades quite different. So there was a long time when the people have been satisfied with the result. A lot of ecosystem services, as we call it today, as we uh, are, are integrated. But people more and more question who is doing the work, who has the power to, for the slide, <laughs> who has the power to bring these ecosystems back, and who does not have the opportunity to be part of this game. So there are some secondary effects of the multifunctional and integrated forest management, and I will be a bit faster now at this moment. So one is that, of course, this male-driven approach, this expert approach has some disadvantages because, because they make clear they are the powerful parties who make this kind of decisions. And they are uh, keen enough uh, to make very clear who has the power and to make sure where is the wall and who is on which side of the wall. And I will try to explain this with one of the slides. So this is the typical entrance of a Central European forest. So uh, you know whether you are welcome or not. And if I take one example, let's take the big one here. It was the picture was somewhere in, in Germany. It says Frei für Forstbetrieb. Even if you do not understand German, this is a strong message. So this alliteration, alliteration perhaps. Um, so this Frei für Frei für Forstbetrieb is something that you understand. So it's the we talk about freedom. It's not just about um, traffic regulation or something like that. We talk about freedom. And people understand whether you are the party that is free, because you have studied forestry, like me, for example, so I'm free in the forest, or whether you are not free. So at least it's the language of the Cold War somehow. So we have the wall here, and we have a free land on the other side for some of the parties, and we have the non-free world, the prison on the other side. And at least if I take one example, so somebody put it here, this uh, little picture on, I love bikes, so maybe that this interest group is especially um, characterized with a specific view on the freedom in uh, the forest. I would like to talk a bit about forest ecosystem services also in private forestry. So. Millions of people in Central Euros, Europe own forests. They often own maybe a hectare, maybe less. And the funny thing is that they do very different things on their parcels. So it's something like integrated forest management because these people are so diverse and they do so diverse management or even non-management. The curious thing is that especially the scientists they do not write books about this group saying, wow, they are so diverse. They do something like integrated forest man management, but they, do the, they play the same game. So they have a wall, some, some, some here in between or in their head, saying, well, there are the good ones. These are those who produce the timber, and there are the bad ones. These are those who manage the forest for recreational purposes or whatever. So the large part of the research in this field is mainly asking what is normal forestry, so something like um, the timber producers and who are the obscure other cases. So in the past this has mainly been the farmers, so in the old days those who were asking for the meadows, those who were asking for the litter or whatever, and today these are the, the urban forest owners, they are not normal as they are not ready to produce the timber as they are expected. So the wall is quite clear following the normal timber producing um, forestry. I found a nice term in the PhD thesis of uh, Mrs. Meyer. She is uh, with us. So the, the, the street level bureaucrats, they are quite important persons because now a lot of programs uh, want to implement integrative forest management. And they do it for Europe, they do it for Germany, they do it on the regional level. And the, the nice thing what these people like um, um, Mrs. Meyer uh, found out is the interesting thing is on the implementation level. These people have all the same objectives, but in fact they do quite different things 
if it comes in the implementation phase. So there are quite diverse situations down on the ground. If we follow this um, pot, uh, bottom, no, sorry, this uh, top-down implementation approaches as we do it mainly in the field of um, biodiversity um, protection. I come back to these mountain bikers and I take some pictures or I, I've stolen some pictures uh, from a Facebook uh, group where mountain bikers meet each other and talk about the things that they observe in, in forests. And of course, this is now the classical bubble, only mountain, mountain bikers um, make some observations in the field. They all are, drive around with these GoPros, they make the pictures immediately, they bring them immediately to the internet, and, and then they all have seen this picture. Frei für Forstwirtschaft, no freedom for mountain bikers. And now they observe very carefully what's happening there. So somebody is not satisfied with this road because he said the trail has been nicer before. Somebody is not um, satisfied with this track here because during one day he could not use the track as he did the day before. And somebody is even uh, ready to solve the problem. So he has always a saw with him and he's documenting this in Facebook. So if he is confronted with this kind of problems, he has an easy solution, taking the saw. And freedom is also with the mountain bikers in this case. So there are funny things that are happening in forests in Central Europe at the moment. And they also somehow lead to a contribution to integrated forest management because new practices are now, can be now observed in these forests. But the implementation process is quite different to that, what we could see if we talked about Natura 2000, for example, where we have this bottom up, uh, sorry, this top down approaches. Now in this field of recreation, it's quite often the other way around. So people just do something, what leads to something that I hear now call something like a renegotiation of the property rights in these forests. Ms. Miller, uh, Ms. Miller already talked about an emotional discussion about uh, forests in, in Central Europe. And some of these discussions may also go back to the old system of reintegration of some of these values. So we have been so proud that we started rational, evidence-based forest management. And it seems that we did not only reintegrate the cows and the shafts, the shafts, not the sheep, <laughs> <laughs> but we also somehow <laughs> excluded the fairy tales. Some of the wolves, of the um, little man running around in the forest, so all these kind of stories, they have also somehow been lost when we started our evidence based rational forestry approach. And now some people are seeing the cinema at the moment, sell a lot of book, bringing back this kind of fairy tales. At least they do not talk about forests, they talk about society. They take the forest, what is a very rich resource of metaphors, and tell us stories about the society, who loves whom, who is connected with whom, and they do it with the example of the forest, and a lot of people like it. And the dangerous thing is, of course, they somehow bring it back to the forest and base now their suggestions for forest management concepts on this kind of stories. And to make sure that there's not only one who does this kind of uh, fairy telling, uh, I take another author here, from this case now from Austria, uh, Mr. Thoma, who wrote a book where he somehow does um, marketing for his timber products that he is uh, selling. But anyhow, somehow he tells the same stories as Mr. Wohlleben too. So he makes a wonder world, or he offers a wonder world um, based on trees, and he based a very critical, um, and he describes a very critical view on the society when he observes the man and his crisis. The result is that at least we are somehow um, challenged by a, a new big uh, story that uses the cooperative nature as a, a model, but that um, does not see these people, the forest owners, the forest professionals, in their role 
as they see themselves as the integrators. So this is the role how that they would like to be perceived, that they are the strong people bringing back this, bringing back that, and talking to the society how successful everything has been integrated. But they mainly have the new story and they describe the role of people who are destroying uh, the forest when they touch this kind of pictures. Well, and now, some analysis starting in the very past, no integration at all, then maximizing integration for two generations. What can we do now? So I uh, choose this picture from Berlin again, as it, uh, this was uh, the, the biggest uh, Fridays for Future uh, demonstration in, in, in Berlin, very close to the place where the wall uh, has been. And people are asking not only for the climate change, they also ask for forest management. And at least what I would conclude from my presentation somehow is the integrative forest management currently functions better on the site level, where we have a lot of good examples, but it has some problems on the discourse level at the moment. And I think one of the challenges, the main challenge is, is somehow crossing the walls that we established uh, during the last uh, decades. And I will make three suggestions and then I will close the presentation. One suggestion is, well, communication on the side. It's always a nice um, possibility if you meet the people. Um, I like this example here on the left. I think the picture was made in the Netherlands. So there was a forest owner who was just explaining that there are red dots on a tree and he put it on a sign saying, why are there red dots on a tree? This is an example from Austria where they teach uh, the people. And this is an example from Bavaria. And the funny thing is that Greenpeace is teaching the people within the public forest enterprise and whatever. So there a, was a possibility uh, to uh, discuss and to learn from different um, perspectives. I see a need for new planning instruments. So forestry in Central Europe is strong if you talk about yield, counting timber, uh, monitoring uh, forest growth. We have a long tradition. We have good planning instruments. Uh, we um, did more or less the same things in the field of biodiversity protection. We have good planning instruments, but at least in the field of recreation, uh, social values, it's still a voluntary thing whether this is integrated or not. It's mainly a question whether the people on the ground, so these street level bureaucrats, are ready to do the implementation or not. Participatory mapping of the perception of forests, of forest uses, is one tool that could help uh, to integrate this uh, really uh, within the forest planning uh, processes. And the last thing, and this is now an example from the, from the strategic level, from the policy level, I think we need kind of um, round table negotiations where the forest industry, the forest owners in Germany, uh, the nature conservation uh, activists uh, meet, sport, tourism, and health industry. And I'm happy that um, the BMEL has such a platform. So the WASEG in German is the German acronym office this. And uh, we published um, a, a first paper where we mainly had two messages. So one of the, well, part of these trade-offs is um, that um, the access rights within Germany should be harmonized to make the life, for example, for the bikers a bit easier. And the second thing is that um, forest owners uh, have a high interest now that they do not rely only on timber prices, but also on the financing of ecosystem services. And this was negotiate, negotiated within these round table talks and um, shows that the different actors that all somehow participate within the use of the forests can also talk together when they meet in Berlin and speak together uh, in the direction of policy. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Tech on uh, technology. Yes, perfect. Um, thank you very much. I borrowed my mic to uh, Ulrich, so I'm using this mic now. Um, thank you very much for your very illustrative presentation, which came at the right time after one and a half hours of uh, 
of a session. I um, think it was very entertaining and uh, needed because we ha will have to continue for another one and a half hours, more or less. But then there will be coffee, etc., provided. Um, yeah, it, uh, it was uh, uh, interesting that you mentioned the elephant who is always in the room when we discuss about uh, integrated forest management, which is Peter Wohlleben. He might be mentioned again during the next couple of days. Um, you also mentioned the gender imbalance in forestry, which is something mm. that we might... I had a different picture, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> which is something that unfortunately also applies to our panel. So, But Ying and Yang try to try to balance that out. Anyways, um, now there's, so thank you. Uh, it's maybe something we can uh, take up in the final discussion. Now I would like to allow some for some questions and I'm also um, ready to give up my mic again um, from the audience there. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah, Bart Moes, uh, K11. Yeah, it's getting very excited. Um, start to see the red line uh, to uh, this uh, different stories. And so it's all about a crucial question. Should we go to uh, land sharing or to land sparing in forest management? So separating conservation from production, yes or no? And uh, of course, the integrated forest management uh, is where we foresters uh, believe in. But yeah, um, Christian Massier says, uh, yeah, the try it. That's a really nice compromise with a bit of land sharing and a bit of land sparing. But then the question is, um, how much uh, inland sharing and how much inland sparing? And in different countries, we heard stories from the tropics, from Russia, um, from Central Europe. We try to find, but it's not so sure if we use the right arguments. Uh, very often, to decide how much uh, land sharing and land sparing there should be, um, there's power relationships uh, that play. Um, there's uh, yeah, beliefs of all kinds, so is there not a need to decide more based really on the ecosystem services that we, we should produce and also on legacies? I want to uh, point you to a, a new paper in Bioscience of 2019 which says to decide if we have to go more in land sharing or of land sparing, we should look in, 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 the, in the legacies. Um, like Bo Larson said, it has a, a long history of uh, forest management of maybe 5,000 years. Then the biodiversity is more in equilibrium with that, and there's more uh, better reasons um, to, do, to go in land sharing and, and to integrate forest management. So that would be true for, uh, for Europe. While in other countries, uh, uh, in the tropics, for example, or, or in Canada, where the, the use history is maybe only 200 years, um, they do a much better deal uh, in land sparing and put most of the land just in conservation or intensive uh, forest management. So, yeah, I, I, I would like to hear your, your opinion on that. Um, are we looking at the right arguments to decide how much uh, forest we put into multifunctional management or in uh, conservation? Yeah, a, l a lot of points uh, that you made. Perhaps I take out one. And I think an interesting indicator is, is the legislation. And I, when I was talking about um, property rights, uh, who can do what, uh, who is really integrated, who has the power, then of course legislation is a good indicator. And um, a lot of my work is now dealing with um, the question of access rights. And a lot of interest groups now start to read um, forestry legislation in European countries very carefully. And they find out that, of course, sometimes the societal situation from the 1970s is still... Um, mirrored in the legislation of the 19 of the 2020s and and this is of course provokes um, well, provokes uh, conflicts and therefore this is an important starting point to do this kind of, of review of the legislation whether it fits well to the situation of societies today and even in the in the future and I think this is um, an important uh, starting point for the for the discussions that we can have later here on the, on the plenum or within this uh, conference. Hi, I'm Amna from University of Padua. Thank you so much for such an interesting uh, presentation. 
uh, I would like to ask you that um, do you think integrated uh, forest management is also a sustainable forest management? <laughs> like for example, <laughs> if you are including recreational values and a lot of different things as well, so do you think it is also a sustainable way to manage forest? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you uh, open the Bible, and you uh, read in the in the in the early books. I will find this uh, story of of um, Moses, and he was a very lucky man because uh, he once uh, woke up and then he had to go to a field, and then um, a stone was given to him, and on this stone, you know, they had very clear rules, and he would have known what is uh, sustainable. A management of the desert where he lived. Uh, unfortunately, nobody brings us this kind of stone if we talk about sustainable management. So we have to make our own uh, definitions. And I think uh, integrative concepts can lead to sustainable management. And, and I try to make sure that there are two things that we have to uh, think about. One is the result. And the other thing is, is the process. And I would say uh, still we look much more on the result and not enough on the, on the process. And perhaps this is an, uh, on somehow an answer to your, to your question. If we, uh, if we talk about, discuss about um, the, the integrative management, uh, it's, I think this is, you, you had the two minutes, but in the end it's not a question of 20 or 30 percent, but it's a question um, how did we reach uh, the, the definition is 20% enough or is it not enough? And if you take the two things together, then integrative management may be closely uh, linked uh, to our understanding of sustainability. Yeah, that was a very fundamental question, obviously. <laughs> um, we will continue um, with Eduardo now, but before, yeah, you can come to the stage already. Um, I would like to encourage all of you, because we still have more than one hour ahead of us, to just stand up and do some stretching, maybe. Georg was the one who proposed that. <laughs> and I think, yeah, just take advantage, do some stretching. Um. <laughs> Two minutes of stretching and shaking the legs, and then we will continue. Please do not, please do not leave the room. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, now we have to start again. <laughs> that was not intended. Okay. That
kannst du mal... Super, okay. Hello, everybody. Dear participants, dear participants, please take a seat again. There will be another coffee break in an hour, so you will manage. Please take a seat again. No problem. <laughs> yeah, please close the door and have a seat. Yeah, that was Georg opening the box of the Pandora. <laughs> But it's fine. I think everyone enjoyed a short refreshment. So we can uh, start with the next presentation. Um, yeah. You might have uh, realized that we were still missing the Mediterranean perspective. And with Eduardo Rojas Briales, we will um, get some more information on. Um, challenges and opportunities for Mediterranean forests. Thank you very much. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Guten Tag. Bonjour. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation, and I can only congratulate EFI and all the partners for arranging this very interesting and suggestive conference. And of course, it's not easy at the end of the row. I thought before the coffee, now it's after the coffee, uh, to really bring something complementary to, to the very, very, very substantive contribution that has been done uh, during the past hour. I would just like to highlight uh, that in the first uh, with Robert and in the last uh, with Ulrich, I found a very clear social approach. And especially if we're speaking of our ecosystem services and very especially the complexity of forest, I think we have been caught especially in boreal and a little bit also in temperate forest, very much trapped wood production by diversity, which is a very narrow approach. Forests provide many things. I think very especially the social dimension that has been long in unattended is crucial in the developing world, in the tropics, but as well other places and especially in places where you are not in flatlands, which is typical in boreal conditions, the issues of soil and water are even more important because that's the basis of anything. And this is, and I will start then with the Mediterranean presentation, something that explains a lot uh, the development of forests in Mediterranean areas. And I would say in the real Mediterranean areas because we have the climate, Mediterranean climate areas in other continents. So I will try to go a little bit to the Frame conditions, just this picture shows you the importance of soil and water and what would be the trends, the institutional answers and the trends. Uh, to situate you, uh, Mediterranean area first is very small, so we could skip this if from a uh, strict area perspective. Just compared with Russia, uh, the Mediterranean forests of the world, including the Areas outside of the Mediterranean and other regions of the world do not count to more than 1% of the world forest. So we could fast uh, close the presentation because of its uh, apparent irrelevance in size. Uh, but they have a strong historical, cultural, and touristic relevance, and that makes them uh, eventually more important. And they are a single one. And I would have to go a little bit to the natural science perspective where rainfall and temperature are anticyclic. This is the definition. In all other climates, except deserts where it can be erratic, uh, rainfall is either permanent, uh, oceanic climates, or rainfall is parallel to temperature, be in the subtropical and very special in the temperate zone. This generates the prerequisites to drought. Simplifying, we have a Mediterranean climates, uh, the winter is like Ireland, the summer is like the Sahara. Uh, and also this region, which is in all places of the world, be it between Europe, North Africa, and West Asia, or other places in the border to the deserts, 
And this makes that the potentially affectation by climate change is huge, not until now very critical, but it could be worse in the future. The other element, especially if you try to have figures, information, and so on, despite uh, FAO and other partners did a huge work with the State of Mediterranean Forest 2013 and 2018, is the fact that despite you have lots of uh, literature, when it comes to statis statis statistics, it's extraordinary problem to do it. I mean, in the Boreal, you just take these five countries and you have the statistics practically. In the Mediterranean, you have a problem. What is Mediterranean? Let's keep now to our Mediterranean, not, not the extended one in Chile and Australia and so on. Well, do you take the riverine countries? You leave out Portugal. Portugal is the single relatively big country that is pure Mediterranean. Not Spain, not France, not Italy. It's pure Mediterranean. So the most Mediterranean country, most likely uh, in, in this part, is a non-riverine country because it doesn't t t uh, reach the sea. If you take the watershed, you put Uganda, the Nile, or you put huge parts through the Black Sea of uh, Russia and Ukraine, which are not Mediterranean. So at the end, most likely, many people use the olive cultivation border, but that, that's a discussing arguable border. So the border is difficult. And this border makes that with except of the eastern and southern Mediterranean country where any forest that exists is Mediterranean, in the northern one, where we have the strong statistics, the EU members and Balkan countries, what they have as Mediterranean forest is only a share. In France, it's a small share. In, in Portugal, it is full, Cyprus as well. But in Spain, it, it is the majority. In Italy, it is 50 to 50, if, if 50, 50. So this makes that many statistics are national. So you cannot split them. Uh, forest law, uh, utilization in France, it's national. How the hell do you want to calculate on Mediterranean area? So the figures are extraordinarily complex to, to manage. And for example, Jordan has Mediterranean forest, the single one they have, they don't touch the sea. And even Sagros in uh, Iran is Mediterranean. So it makes enormously complex. It's easy to say what is Mediterranean, it's very difficult to set the border. It has a high population density as a region. There is a strong rural decline happening. Uh, it started later in the south, but it's happening, Algeria, for example. Uh, it has had, in general, either no or very short secondary phase, industrial phase, for example, very important in boreal countries, at least European. The sector is, little, is very little competitive, and uh, non wood forest products are important, but they have been traditionally either social expropriated or been lost uh, over the time. And the ownership is normally uh, in the normally a state, but in the northwest from Italy to Portugal, predominantly private and communal. And this strong rural decline shows in this extreme map of my own country of Spain, where you see where 50% of Spain lives and where the rest of 50% of Spain lives. If we go back to how the development has been, and there were some comments also by other colleagues before, uh, until four years uh, to present, we had a similar land use as uh, Australia or many parts of the US. It was a pre-settlement uh, population that used, Aboriginal population that used fire and uh, was a hunter and with the time progressively become, uh, by the domestication of cattle, become grazers. It is about 4,000 years to now that agros and, for example, and very especially silvo pastoral systems started and we have extended ones in the Peri Peninsula these days as a montado system. But between 70 and the 18th century especially, uh, we had a very strong population growth. And in the 19th as well, with the top, uh, the, uh, reaching the top of population in the rural areas and deforestation, uh, despite it was really not close forest, it was big trees around, but there was a strong deforestation and a maximum in agriculture. But then suddenly, uh, train came, phylloxera came, fossil energies, urbanization, and things turned to exactly the opposite, and the people left the countryside and the forests and shrubs recover enormously. We can speak of a boomerang landscape that had passed from relative stable conditions of a century suddenly to be deforested and then to go exactly to the other situation. And this is the region, if you compare the FAO figures, you could have the size, you would, some people from outside would think, well, uh, the UK, the Netherlands, uh, Denmark should be the for most forested countries of Europe, no. If you take out some Alpine countries, small Alpine countries, and the Scandinavian, the most forested countries of Europe is the Southern European countries. This is something people don't understand. And the countries that have had more forest recovery uh, in, in the past uh, 40, 50 years has been from Portugal to Turkey. 
and even Iran has had forest recovery. Uh, why? The basic reason is orographic. Practically, what they had, most of this agriculture that has been abandoned or all, is a marginal agriculture in slopes that had no way to work, and that's why it was abandoned. The same has happened in southern China. It is not, the good agriculture has not been abandoned a single hectare in China except for infrastructures and cities. It is the slope agriculture that had really very tough work, and this has led to forest recovery. Uh, and something new is happening. The Romans described, most likely it exists before, a very clear land use that had been kept over a long time, which was the urbe, the ortus, horticulture, uh, agar, agriculture, uh, saltus, grazing land, and foris, the rest, or silva, uh, the forest at the very end. Now we have the urban uh, forest interface, a really dramatic example of unwise land use in which the trees touch the, ci the cities and uh, because people have moved uh, outside also in, in suburbs and, and uh, uh, holiday location and the forests have occupied everything because there are lots of pioneer species, very especially Pinus alepensis, which are formidable pioneer species that is allowing this forest growth. And then we have really very complex uh, fires like the one in Greece a few years ago. So what has been the institutional answers? The first thing, especially from a research perspective, is that for forest governance in the region is a very late comer discipline. In many countries, it, it is even not included in study plans, and in some, it just reached a few years ago. So in my own country, started 2010 as a compulsory uh, discipline. In the South and East Mediterranean, there's a strong state role as owner, both, and forest service, and they are quite efficient. One has to recall that, uh, for example, the Turkish Forest Service is one of the most efficient in the world. Uh, for example, forest fires, investment, uh, revolving fund, really one very high performance rates, but also the Moroccan or the Tunisian comparable. Uh, they have strong funding, and they are efficient in combating forest fire. There's quite specificums in the case of Israel with this KKL, KKL, then countries that have entered wars like Libya or Syria. And Greece, <laughs> should be more accounted to this group despite being a EU country because of the high uh, state forest share. Where in the northwest Mediterranean from Italy to the west, state forests are totally irrelevant, less than 5%, and what we have is in the mountain communal forests of different legal forms, and in a gray area where the state manages to a certain extent and the communes have little to say, and two thirds about private forests, most in minifundium and in strong abandonment due to this factor. And challenge, and big challenges with fires, uh, fi uh, with fires since 1970. One has to recall that until 1960, all the heating and even cooking was done with firewood, and then uh, butano gas established a good network in many countries, and there was a strong energy shift, and then the uh, brushes and shrubs grow, and from the moment they close the landscape, the fires start. Uh, there's a strong uh, protected area share, uh, non-compared with the rest of the EU countries, especially the old EU countries where the Natura 2000 share is around 10%. In the case of Spain, it is 27, and some countries even higher. And of course, I recall the France, uh, Mediterranean forests are anecdotic. And Italy and Spain, they had uh, in parallel a very strong decentralization of forestry. And payment of environmental services is weak uh, uh, developed has several reasons. If someone is interested, we could enter it. What could be the trends? I think there is one a very important element here in driving force that can even, in countries that are fire prone or have the risk to be a little bit put in doubt this debate, integrative or segregationist model. Uh, and this is the maturing debate that is coming around the issue of forest fires, very strong research driven. Uh, in, in focusing from the symptom, asking for more technical means, to the crude causes, which is the land abandonment and the absence of resilient landscapes. And there, several players, but very especially Pau Costa Foundation and Mark Castelnau have done an are doing an incredible contribution. And I put you this graph from him. Uh, this is the, uh, one of these huge uh, mega fires uh, recently. Uh, and uh, you see, uh, the red line is the absolute limit of uh, combating capacity of the fire, uh, um, the, the fire uh, means that we have today, and there is no expectation that we can uh, reach more than this 10,000 uh, kilowatts per, per square meter, uh, that, that, we, uh, that we can overcome this. This is the maximum capacity of the fire extinctions, and you see that this fire over many hours was 10 times above that. 
So if we are not able to create landscapes that have less fuel load, available fuel load, which is not all the biomass, the big trees do not burn. It's only uh, the branches, the small branches, and the bark, and the leaves, and needles. If we're not able to do it, then really we will get to fires that no one can control as the, until they collapse. So I think this is a very interesting approach that I bring in forward, and I think that may res the, uh, reshape totally the agenda once duly digested. We have an increased uh, cooperation inside the Mediterranean, which was not known uh, 20 or 30 years ago, and the FEMET has done an incredible work to close cooperation inside the region and not only towards other developed areas, and the issue, of course, of adaptive man management, including using of sky burning. There are open issues, in some cases, with lots of paradox. Uh, one, of course, uh, the debate that, you know, foresters 100 years ago said forests were ideal for water. Then there came this, the, especially from the World Bank, uh, the school that was very critical to afforestation in drylands, saying the, bringing the issue of the water yield into account, and now we have uh, new research coming in. I share the, the one of Del Campo, that there are other players uh, that put uh, this issue of the role of forest in drylands more with a scientific background. And basic conclusions is that it is the ideal issue is to keep forests around 60 to 70 percent close uh, to avoid very dense forests that are those who lo have lose a lot of water due to interception. But of course, if you go too far, then you are losing a lot by evaporation. So there has to be at least reasonable middle ground. But you need for that you need management. And EC, you are uh, getting a water yield of 50 millimeters is 500 cubic meters per hectare. So this is the first <laughs> contribution of forest in dry, uh, drop prune areas. Then we are in a biodiversity hotspot, and it has not lost significant species. It is not losing species in the last uh, decades. On the contrary, we are recovering a lot of, of iconic species from the lynx and the wolf and so on. And it has had a strong, long, intensive settlement. So this idea of the segregation in biodiversity, at least in the Mediterranean, is hardly to be uh, accepted. So there is an issue to see how we better integrate biodiversity into forest management than the segregation approach, especially because abandoned land will burn much more. And just a figure, 2018, 36% of the burn areas in Europe went to 2,000. We don't have 38% of uh, forests in the EU. So just a figure that, and this is, uh, there's also CIFR uh, research uh, showing that protected areas, uh, strict protected areas uh, have much more conflicts, including fires, that, that the ones managed by indigenous peoples. So again, the social issue. Uh, there, is, uh, there is an issue to, re to recalculate correctly the drive-offs between optimal uh, stocks in forests that are resilient and carbon balances, because we have to also calculate the potential risk of forest fire. So we have to keep there, uh, let's say, this also into account. Uh, we have to consider as well how we can operationalize traditional knowledge, a very important issue, and we are losing the last uh, rural generation. Uh, then uh, we need also to actualize uh, legislation, not only forest, but sometimes even civil legislation that is strong uh, primary to the time of the rural uh, society of 100 years ago and not adapted to today's uh, situation. The social architecture is weak. This is an issue that has been to be tackled. The munifundium that is common to all the northwestern Mediterranean has to be tackled, and most likely a joint project, a big joint project that would be led by EFI or participate that would be very important to find solutions. Uh, as we have in industry, uh, the big industry today are not shared by a single person and managed by a single person. They are all shareholders, and ownership and, and management are separated, and there is an urgent need for a solution. Uh, also, the, the strong state interventions in, in many cases uh, could be softened by more management plans, and also institutional uh, stability. Instability has been shown frequently with strong changes uh, in a frequent cases. But on the other hand, the interesting development like, like the regional private forestry boards like in, in France or Catalonia. Just this picture to show you how important uh, the, the lack of forest cover is when you have very strong rainfalls is the picture in the dry parts of Gran Canaria after 200 millimeters in a few hours. And a very debated issue also in Australia, the sky burning, well, at the beginning, it may not be, look very nice, but if you see, it's uh, very cheap, so you can do much more hectares, and it can stabilize many areas if you don't have resources for other, uh, for other more costly means.
In concluding, uh, and it has been also said by other colleagues, proactive communication strategies are, of course, absolutely needed. And if we want to move to payment of environmental services, especially where the forest managers and owners are different of the state, so the Northwest uh, Mediterranean, it is very important to focus on the funding, how it has to be funded, because there is the real break. Uh, laws where it is included and then practically not uh, implemented is basically due to funding. And of course, the opportunity of bioeconomy that is strongly ad advocated by EFR, I, are, uh, are there. Uh, but we need to create a more inclusive bioeconomy approach in which non-wood forest products, let's think uh, building is the second after energy, uh, the second low-hanging fruit. Well, if you, where do you think that the building is going to happen? In the, in the center, it's basically in the tropics. Do you think they're going to import Swedish, Finnish, or Canadian wood? They should use bamboo, their own resources, because tropical wood is by far too expensive. Uh, and too little available. So at the end, there's some areas that could do pines, but basically bamboo, bamboo has a huge potential in the construction sector. So we need to, in order to, to create really a critical mass in the EU and outside for bioeconomy, we, we have to move it from a traditional more in forest industry driven to an integrated approach in which all the land use and sea use activities, agriculture has a lot to bring, lots of sub products and marginal land, the sea, uh, due to bi bioeconomy, of course, organic residues as well, and for sure, also non-wood forest products have to be strongly integrated. Then we may, may have sufficient critical mass to strive bioeconomy together, of course, with cascade use and other elements that ensure that we have sufficient resources to substitute, because there is a really win-win for climate change if we start to substitute products. So I look forward for the discussion and uh, hope that the wish a fruitful conference the next two days. Thank you very much, Eduardo, for this interesting presentation. Very intense and very nice overview of the Mediterranean. So for now, I would like to ask the audience just uh, if there are any clarification questions or any feedback remarks on this particular presentation, please. Uh, just wait for the mic, please. Hello, my name is Barbara. I'm from the Europe Park Federation, but I'm Portuguese. So this okay. topic concerns me. Um, I don't know if you know, but uh, around two and a half years ago, 500,000 hectares um, burned in just one night. So it's a very serious problem there. And what I know about the Portuguese legislation is that um, prescribed burning is possible, is predicted, but the centralized system takes so long to answer those uh, requests that when the permit arrives, it's no longer time to do prescribed burning. So my question is, do you have successful examples of prescribed burning being used in other Mediterranean areas? You mentioned Australia, but uh, what about in Europe? Well, it, it, it's true. The, if we just uh, think that this has to be a bottom-up approach, will hardly work. Uh, what I can follow, I'm not a specialist in this area, but I am following is, on one hand, a prescribed burn, if it is more agricultural-wise, especially uh, in uh, agriculture related to, uh, to trees, so fruit trees and so on, that normally place near the forest and creates after the pruning uh, a problem around this month, March, uh, or next month, uh, in early April, uh, that then you use the system that farmers ask for permission, so you have the control, and then you try to do all the burning in one day this, in this municipality the next time, and then you put the firemen and, and try to avoid this kind of interface, agriculture forest interface fires. Uh, but in the forest, uh, what they are doing, basically the most proactive uh, firefighters is that they themselves, in the non-risk period, uh, after a certain, let's say, uh, they take some vacation, uh, but they use the, uh, the many months where the risk is either medium or low to do themselves this, uh, this uh, prescribed burning. And this is much more logical. Uh, I know the case very especially of Catalonia, where they are different ministries than the Forest Service. In some cases, they are integrated. But this is basically what they do as a training. Because when you have a real fire, and you, the only way when the fire is out of control is a counter fire. If the firefighters do have not experience in prescribed burning in good conditions, in easy conditions, 
it is really risky to do it, uh, to apply it. So it's a very well interesting training. The other line of, of work that they are doing is uh, as in each place, due to orography and winds in the critical dry period, you can modulate how fires were and even reconstruct historical fires. You know exactly how the, depending where it starts, the fire will evolve. And due to orography, normally it is not totally flat, there are certain critical points where the fire can be stopped or will multiply. And the issue, critical issue there is to do all kinds, so to concentrate the resilient program exactly on those plots. Uh, in the rest of the territory, it can be included in forest management, and there can be recommendations that agricultural land is not abandoned and gets uh, cap funds uh, to keep open. Uh, but basically, uh, it's at, the, at least in the short term for the next 10 years, is identifying these key points and keeping them with the least vegetation possible and accessible so that in case of fire, you can go there and act. And then, of course, if possible, include it as a tool and uh, more and more management plans, but there are people that are working in the approval of man management plan, are instead of the very expensive uh, slashing of, 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 the, of the brushes and so on, are including prescribed burning because the people start to see that it's not very expensive, they can speak with the firemen and they're even eager to come, I don't know, in December, January or so, to burn and, and now we see in some fields that there are much more mushrooms, or at least you see them, that they are much more better for cattle because they're more accessible, so there are other advantages of, of uh, frequent prescribed burning uh, practices. Thank you very much. And at this moment, I would like to um, shift into uh, questions and answers um, and to this end I would like to ask all the keynote speakers to come here to the stage please uh, but before we actually start uh, coming up with questions I would like to ask all of you uh, to just take a minute and reflect for yourself what you have heard now what is after this tour of the planet, what is the trend that is delineating here about the possible options for the integrated forest management? And after that minute of your digestions and on, of your own reflection of what we have heard here from uh, the speakers, uh, I would like you to turn to your next neighbor and just discuss in pairs for three minutes what would be the question that you would like to have answered here by one of the panel members that has not been discussed so deeply yet? So we will measure the, Gesha will measure the time, but we will, you just take one minute for your own reflection and then turn to your neighbor and discuss in pairs. What is the possible question that you would like to ask? And at the same time, I would like to ask our panel members to also discuss among themselves what are the key take-home messages that are starting to delineate here?
Yeah. So you can turn yeah. it off. The five minutes are over now, and I'm very grateful that no one has le left the room <laughs> again. <laughs> um, now we would like to... Um, is anybody listening? <laughs> I'm happy that you're having very um, inspired conversations, but now it's time to ask questions to the panelists. Um, and we would like to ask you um, to um, say your name again and address the respective panelists that you would like to address with a question to enable us. Oh, that needs some running, but she's coming, Thomas. <laughs> Thomas Hausmann uh, from the Ministry of Agriculture here in Germany. First of all, many thanks uh, for the very enriching discussion, even with fairy tales and, uh, and the Bible. Very interesting, and also thanks, Geisha, for the coffee break. I think that was, was really needed. <laughs> so, we had some discussion, um, and I would like to pick up um, one aspect, uh, which was mainly addressed by Mr. Schrammel, but I think also by all the other speakers. And I fully agree that the foresters and the forest sector should maybe in future take more into account the demands and the interests of the society. I think that would be a statement which maybe most of the colleagues in the room would, would agree on. However, we had a long discussion last week at, at the expert level meeting of the Forest Europe process exactly about this statement. Because, first of all, um, who is the society? Are there those who are the loudest? Do there exist research in Europe or maybe in other parts of the world what the society, that means all of us, really believes? And are those interests more important than the uh, risk, uh, the interest of the forest owners? Um, so this would be um, our question or my question to the uh, group, whoever would, who would like to pick it up. And maybe if I can hand over because it was a group discussion to... Yes, of course. Uh, Jerry Wilkes from ETH Zurich. Um, I have two questions which are similar to this. And the first one will be what about private forest owners? I think the situation in the US is pretty different as in Europe. There is, uh, for example, in Austria, 80% of the forest area is owned by private forest owners. And if we take the situation in Switzerland, private forest owners own uh, 1.5 percent of uh, 1.5 in average uh, hectares. So they have other attitudes. As if they have other uh, objectives, which is not always management, which is not always recreation. So what would what happen with them in this segregation process? And uh, additional to it, what would happen with this multifunctionality of forests? Because we actually speak that forests have to be multifunctional, providing the, the, the different services that they provide, what would happen uh, to this with this segregation discussion that we are taking now? Do you have a certain keynote speaker you would like to address with this question? I think my question others more or less what uh, Professor Sharman said, so maybe he's my main address, but I think all of them can try to answer them, yeah. So maybe you would like to start, and then um, someone else from the panel could take up the question that Thomas Hausmann asked. I start with the, with the society and your question, um, are the loudest those who should be heard? And of course, um, if you ask the question like that, I would say no. <laughs> um, I, I think about the alternative um, answer, what, what would be the, the better approach? At least I think a first step should be that those who do forest planning should know about the needs or the interests of the people. Whether they are ready or able um, to integrate everything that is somehow addressed is the, is the second uh, step of a process. But uh, to offer uh, this kind of information to the people who do forest planning is an important uh, first step. And um, to give you an, an example, so I just had this uh, one, one slide on this issue. Uh, where I introduced um, this approach of, of participatory mapping. So the idea is that people um, 
um, construct the map. Uh, what are my most important places in a forest? Where do I go to? Why do I like them? And, and this at least um, leads to a, to a picture or to a map that can be used within the, in the planning process. It can be used. And, and in general, we have this kind of distinction between different ownerships and, and uh, municipality uh, may have another, um, um, another um, 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 yeah, may have another need to, uh, to follow this kind of uh, addressed wishes than a, a private forest owner. But at least to start with, um, to provoke or to, to offer this kind of information is an, is an important um, uh, starting point. Eduardo uh, just uh, uh, raised his hand and wanted to contribute too. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, uh, to Thomas Hausmann, uh, question or comment. Uh, of course, there is a, a risk of a bias in, in the loudness and the silence. And uh, I normally uh, comment the aphonic character of, of a part of the stakeholders, and especially in countries where the legal level threshold is very high, uh, there is the risk that those aphonic are those who have to pay the bill, who are now having everything for free, and of course they don't show up, which is normally energy, touristic, water, and so on. They have an incredible service for free, and they say, why the hell should we go? We are not going to be asked for the differential issue, which would be arguable. We are going to be asked for what anyway has uh, been achieved. And who appears? Those who have no money. And basically are ENGOs, biodiversity crowd, who brings an overestimation of the issue in Europe, in the forest. It's not where the biodiversity issues are. It's in the sea with the plastic. It's in the agriculture that is too intensive. It's the loss of, of the bukash landscape between agriculture and forest, but not in the forest. It's a power struggle. It's not, it's, it's not a substantive issue. And, and, and at the end, any ideology creates its church, and so it, there's a retroalimentation. So that, that's why it happens. So it's very complex how you can balance. I don't say that it has not been done, that you get in all the interests those who don't want to show up due to the risk of payment, those who overcry, those who hardly are there like soil and water, and even those who we do today are not conscious because climate change, we are conscious today. We start to think about the albedo, but this issue existed in the past as well, and we are not conscious. So there needs, so, in, so, so just if it is uh, to go more for the bottom-up approach, the top-down that we did in the past, and. Uh, the protected area Natura 2000 has done in just in 20 years as, as worse or even worse than forest has stopped down, uh, they was someone accountable. So we need a mixture, in my view, uh, where you have some, uh, some top down to ensure accountability and, and, and success and efficiency that top down ensures, uh, and, and much more integration as far as possible from the, from the bottom. So it is inclusive, trying to include also the, the less vocal, and then there is a need of a moderator that is able to ensure long-term perspective and uh, forgotten issues, trade-offs and win-wins and so on, uh, because with a without a moderator it will be difficult. If we move just from the top down to just the bottom up, it could be a chaos. And, and, and this is not what we want, and, and I think the key issue is how we can construct an inclusive system that at the least top down is needed, but very specially moderator role, and I think uh, there are be foresters or other professionals in the moderator area, I think there is a huge work and different scales to, uh, to be able to, to achieve and to build up compromises. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions in the audience that I would like to ask you to formulate your question as one question possibly, because we are limited by time, so... Um, there was the yeah. question concerning the, the private forest ownership. Um, I'm not sure if, if I got the question um, really um, in, in detail. Perhaps you can help me if I, if I do not um, come back correctly to your question. I'm not sure if, if I understood it. Um, um, at least what I wanted to address during my presentation is so we have this really we have this richness of different um, ideas of different management um, approaches that the private forest owners have, and I think it is it would be uh, there is a, a 
this is really, it's a, it's a very nice thing what we find in these different uh, countries. And for many years, we, we followed an approach to convince them that they have to adopt to the classical management strategies of the bigger forest enterprises. And so at least the approach was always, the political approach was always to make them somehow normal. And in fact, uh, these, these kind of approaches were never successful. So they keep their variety, they get even more uh, more diverse than they had been uh, in the past. And uh, somehow you have, you have just to accept this. It, it is as, ex, as diverse as it is. And, and this kind of approach is, so in, in German we have this terrible world of a terrible word of mobilization. So in general, it was about mobilization of timber, but sometimes now the people even use it for the people. They say, well, you have to mobilize uh, the people if we talk to bring them, uh, talk about um, the idea to bring them to timber markets. So at least it's a word that we take from the military language and, and bring it to the, to the forestry. And, and this is somehow an, an absurd idea if you talk, talk about the mobilization of people. And so the, I think that the idea is, or if we talk now about integration in this field, it's mainly about the integration of the people and not so much about the integration in the field that all these people do the, the same things. Was this somehow an answer? <laughs> I had two people here on the right. Yeah, maybe you raise your hands again. <clears throat> okay. I'm Andrea, I'm from University of Freiburg, maybe because it's related to the previous question. Um, we are usually managing forests for future generations, unless we're in the tropics or maybe in the Mediterranean area. And whereas we can try to predict growth, temperatures, precipitation, we cannot really predict societal demands in the future. And I wonder, under the circumstances where people's um, demands are very much influenced by emotions, and then it can be very unpredictable. How much actually should we listen to these these opinions, or like how can we tackle this this uh, topic? Anyone from the panel who would like to take this on? Yeah. Just say a few words. Yeah, please. <laughs> Great, this question was also asked via Twitter, so. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, of course I don't have an answer directly to your questions, but maybe an observation, and I, we discussed a bit about this. W what I see in, in Canada, and I guess in the US that I know a bit more, is actually almost a reflection of what we see on the political, uh, um, I was saying, that what happened in politics, there is some kind of, a, segregation now more and more between people living on the countryside and some of those living in the city and they have more and more different views about how the forest should be managed uh, and I'm uh, very surprised I, I had a, I mean I had a chance to live in Montreal for many years and now I live in the countryside and when I talk to the people I get very different view and different perspective and I could say and I'm not sure if it's because of the elephant in the room but I think he did contribute it a little bit but I do hear a lot people saying that it's almost immoral to cut a tree. And this comes from the city, of course. Cutting a tree is immoral. And um, it's very hard to explain to them that it might not be immoral, that trees die all the time, and that it's part of... But it's, in agriculture, we have the same thing. I mean, it's, it's becoming more and more immoral to, to kill an animal for food. I think... There is a trend in the society, and I haven't heard a lot about it, but I think this might actually um, be a current that we have to consider right now in forestry. And I don't think it will get away. And I know I'm not answering your question, but it, it's part of emotions. It's not always very strongly based in science. Often we, be, we feel as scientists that it should be based on science. But emotions are real. I mean, I actually, I remember a, a philosopher told me that emotions are real, so we have to consider them. We cannot just say uh, it's emotion, it will get away. This is real. It won't go away. We have to deal with it. I don't have an answer, but I think we are facing more and more of this segregation in the view of what we should do with the forest. And I think in the U.S., this kind of constant fighting and going to court is very much like this. And when you talk to some people on one side or the other, you cannot argue. It's almost, 
I call it almost a religious belief. And when it becomes a religious belief, we are useless. It's not our area. Maybe we should bring uh, theolo theologian people to help us. But, um, and, I, and I see that more and more. Yeah. Okay, we have more questions coming up. Yeah. So uh, fr you there was, uh, first there was the person here. Yeah, and then Sven. Hello, my name is Miros Fobor. I am from Czech University of Life Sciences, professor of silviculture. Thank you for a really nice session. And I have a question for all the, all the speakers. So the Central European Forestry was for a long time based on the sustainability. And, uh, but right now we are facing the most, the worst crisis ever, ever recorded in the Euro Central European Forestry for the last 200 years. Uh, the last year was about 50 million cubic meters of bar beetle wood. Uh, the year before also, and this year the prediction are pretty bad. So basically, what's happening right now that Central Europe is exporting the raw, raw conifer timber to China because no one else wants to buy it from us. And I was uh, wondering if you think that uh, this is the right time to think about the paradigm of the Central European forestry and if it was really sustainable, and what and what and how we should manage our forest uh, in the future, because I know, for example, in Germany, there is a big debate which tree species to use, uh, what kind of tree species to put in the forest, and basically, it seems that all the, all the assumptions on which the Central European forestry was based is somehow collapsing. Thank you. And then I have a short comment. Uh, I was not sure if I fully understand, but I, I, I tend to don't agree that the, the Central Europe and Northern Europe is not facing the biodiversity crisis in the forest. I think that uh, there is quite a lot of data showing that the forest management is, uh, is not really doing well in terms of biodiversity. And for example, we are losing the right, last primary forest in Eastern Europe, Romania. Many Balkan countries are losing the last primary forest because of the forest management. And with the loss of the primary forest, we are losing a lot of species. Maybe you would like to pose this question to either Natalia or Robert? Because you've been mentioning the, the tr crisis uh, of the European forest, and uh, yeah, would you like to respond? As for primary forest, I start from from the last uh, information about loss of primary forest in Eastern Europe, as I understood. Yes, um, uh, from my point of view and pro from viewpoint of our Russian scientists, academician Rus Russian scientists, uh, uh, to keep primary forest or something like primary forest, we cannot say now about primary forest, but uh, to keep this primary forest, to keep uh, biodiversity, uh, we, uh, to, to safeguard biodiversity, uh, we need uh, to use segregation approach. And about three points I said, uh, I, I, I was short of time <coughs> to explain, but uh, we think that, for instance, in Russia, we have opportunity, at least now, uh, to have some uh, area, uh, unmanaged area, yes, in, in, in this unmanaged area, at least now we have biota, we have forests, which are more or less, we can say, that this is wild forest under current conditions. Of course, it is not, they are not forests like, uh, uh, if, for instance, 200 years ago before industrial era, but at least it is wild forest under current conditions. And this forest we consider like life supporting system. It is first point. But we have, of course, on very huge area, we have uh, operational forest, so called. We have high, very high level of activity, as I said, wood mining there. Yes. In this case, of course, segregation also, because within this area now, we allocate higher value conservation forest area within this, with ecological corridors, and we can save within these operational uh, areas also, uh, also this biodiversity and forests, all growth forests at least. 
And we have also protected, uh, protective forest. And there we also need uh, to use this segregation approach. It means that when we say about integrative approach, when we say about that we, we of course take into account what people say, what they want, uh, we, we uh, need uh, and we of course would like to take into account their interests, but from my point of view, uh, to manage forest properly, to have biodiversity, bi biodiversity, all of us, we know that biodiversity is the basis mechanism for all forest ecosystem services. If we have lost the biodiversity, it is uh, what we say about life supporting system, we, have no that, that we will have no that. Yes, and uh, because of that, I think that we, we should have instrument, knowledge-based instrument, and it is our, our scientist, sci scientists' affair, we, we can do that. But, uh, of course, we can take into account uh, people interest uh, and uh, to, uh, to predict different ways of development if we take into account this or that interests and uh, to explain people what can we do or what we cannot do uh, to uh, have sustainable forest management. I think so. Thank you very much. There's, uh, I think we can take one more question. Uh, Sven Wunder from EFI. This relates to, uh, to uh, your comments and uh, follow-up comment on the whole question of emotions versus uh, science. I think Eva Müller raised it in her introduction as well. Um, I think one first thing to, to realize is the whole s sort of concept of ecosystem services is that a lot of these services are, have a highly perceptional element. So what people feel about it is in a way defining for the for the benefit as such. So, uh, so we should be careful not to sort of segregate it too much into a uh, maybe biophysically or technocratically defined uh, uh, truth and 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 emotions. Uh, and the second dimension to it is that, of course, a lot of those biophysical research areas, especially related to environmental services, they have been highly fluctuating. I mean, and what we know today is not necessarily what will be our knowledge tomorrow. So, uh, so, so that insecurity uh, about, about uh, and, and the immaturity of, of, of the science behind it uh, is, I think, in some cases, uh, there is an overlap between a precautionary principle of, of, of conservation, etc., in the public, and, uh, and the precautionary management of, 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 of natural resources, uh, also related to, to, uh, uh, to some of these, uh, especially uh, biodiversity conservation uh, purposes. So, uh, uh, in, in, other, in other words, I would caution against sort of a dichotomy between science and emotions, and maybe a science with emotions is possible. I like your, your compromise, uh, science with emotions, and <laughs> I learned this. So no, I, I have the opportunity that I work now in a mixed team uh, with people who studied uh, sociology, um, communication sciences, psychology, and so on, and they always give me feedback. And this is one of the most important feedback that I get. Um, if you talk to people, do not uh, stick to your data, try to get the emotions of, of people. And the same is, of course, true for other professionals who work in the field. So also people, uh, the foresters, uh, can and should show their emotions. And perhaps this is a part of our education that we somehow try to fill in a lot of information in the heads of, um, of forestry uh, professionals, but do not assist them in showing emotions. And in fact, most of the people that I know who work in this field, whether they own forests they have highly um, developed emotions because of their family and the property and all these things. So this is not only based on facts that this is uh, something that they see just uh, 
the money in the forest, but they see their, their heritage if they talk about the forest, but in general, they start the opening and if they describe the property, they start with hectares and, and cubic meters and these kind of things, but do not talk about their, their feelings. And the same is true for many professionals who start to talk about the soil and, and all other boring things uh, where people are really not interested uh, in, but do not talk about the, the feelings. And, and I think this is a helpful, um, a helpful learning process for scientists, for forest owners and other professionals mm -hmm. too. They have their emotions mm -hmm. yeah. and they should share them and this would make the, the discussion with the public much easier. Okay. okay. <laughs> Sounds promising. Maybe a question for Eduardo. I appreciate very much your presentation. Which is the role of the market for biomass, biomass for energy, in, uh, especially in Southern Europe and in all those contexts where we need uh, to activate uh, management in order to reduce uh, fire risk and other problems of abandonment? Uh, thank you, Davide. I mean, uh, putting in comparison, uh, firewood uh, demand uh, for, for biomass I is like uh, uh, for, for the milk uh, sector, uh, for the dairy sector, if uh, this uh, transparent liquid that comes out, out of uh, yogurt and cheese would have a so strong demand, it would improve okay. all the chain, value chain, because today it's a subproduct that has no hardly any demand. So, mm -hmm. uh, in that sense, it's very important and it can help to do the silviculture needed, uh, not only based on prescribed okay. burning, but also on deep brushing yes. and yes. Uh, pruning and thinnings and so on, and eliminate uh, the competition between lots of trees. Many forests are junk to middle ages and, and are overloaded. And uh, if you eliminate it, the, the, the resilience to fire is better, the resilience to climate change and droughts is much better. There will be more production of seeds. There will be more opportunities for grazing and wildlife. So in that sense, there is a win-win. And the operations can be covered by cost in many cases to the, by today's prices, especially if the infrastructure is sufficient. And in that sense, combining to, to what the previous uh, issue, I think it's very important dealing with society mm -hmm. that when you do these kind of operations, you always leave some uh, non-managed parcels so that people can compare. If because you have to go to a protected area 100 kilometers away, no one retains it. That really you have half a hectare behind the 20 hectares you have done that has not been done. Because at least in the Mediterranean, the public, when they see the both, they don't like this unmanaged. Uh, because if it is not very humid and everything rots, it really doesn't look good what is not unmanaged. So I think that is an opportunity. Another element when we deal with emotions is that, of course, the emotions of the rooted people you commented, or of scientists, are very rooted. But the ones of the public are extraordinarily elusive. People may like to be, live in these houses uh, with a tree entering in the window until a fire comes. Uh, the same is happening now with hunting. There are lots of, at least in Spain, more with hunting and with forestry of people going to court, like in the US. And now we have the biggest region in Spain. Uh, hunting is, is prohibited over one year. There's a big legal discussion. Yes. What is the first accident caused in the roads? It's accidents with wildlife, with big wildlife, wild boars and serfs. When starting people to die in the roads, Things may go to the opposite. So this we have also to consider, and this is not a resource that allows to have changes of this nature. When we have had really years of strong fires, suddenly people said, get rid of the trees. So we have to caution this, issue, this kind get of issue. Get the pink card. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you very much for this interesting overview and for the audience too that has stayed engaged and uh, for the very interesting questions. Now, before closing this session, I would like to ask uh, Robert to perhaps come up with some key take-home <laughs> messages from, from this uh, panel discussion. What are the emerging trends? Where are we going? Where are we heading with the integrated forest management? What are uh, the things that are becoming clear that perhaps we know that all the regions are very different. 
things that have been, we have been discussing have been focusing a lot on Europe. However, perhaps you have seen something that could be said uh, for that is valid for all of the regions and all of the forests that we have seen today uh, across the globe. So, Robert, the floor is yours. I think that's what happens when you are the ugly black duck in the sort of a thing. Eh? <laughs> <coughs> um, where, <coughs> where are we going in terms of integrated forest management? <coughs> I mean, and, and sorry, um, maybe I'm, I'm blunt, or like, I don't think that we are going very far. And if, if you look at what we, had, what we have seen in, in, in many cases, it, it's typically that if you apply a top-down only approach, it doesn't work. Or it works for a certain period of time until some societal demand arrive or, or some change arrived and then suddenly uh, the thing is burning like your place. I mean, it's not also. So I think may <coughs> maybe, uh, in, and, and if you look only at the bottom-up approach, I mean, it, it's unlikely going to work also because then then you are faced by the private individual interest against the sort of the global good. So we really need to find a balanced way where the state or some authority provides some enabling environment and some framework where then you can have a sort of inclusive and, and more than integrated, I think we should have an inclusive forest management. If we want to, to go serious about that, I mean, we should go way beyond the forest. Uh, we should really manage landscapes, and that's typically what the people in the Mediterranean area have been doing for millennia, till people just went to town. And, and then the Mediterranean landscape has been abandoned, and that's why it's burning now. Uh, so that, that, that's really the, the, the thing that we need to understand, and, and uh, it may not be a, an answer to your question, but talking about this, this ownership issue. Uh, in most of the tropic, I mean, sort of, there is no ownership. In most of the old French colony, the land belongs to the state. Well, this land is, occup is occupied by people that have been there for centuries or millennia, and complex people. I mean, does the land belong to the pygmy that are in the forest, or does the land, land belong to the Bantu that came after the pygmy and cleared the forest? Or does the land belong to the logging concession that has a, a paper that says that this is their land? Or does the land belong to whom? And, and that's a very difficult issue that you don't face in many places in Europe because there is a private property. Or the <coughs> but that's the, the, the main problem, one of the main problems that we are facing in the tropics. Who owns the damn place? I mean, so who has the right of the resource? If you are in PNG, the state owns 1% of the land. All the rest is, belongs to the people. If you go to Gabon, the state owns 100% of the land. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really, and, 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 and I think that we are not going to make any progress unless we solve this issue. But it, uh, it's very dif different to the, to the context here. But I think in the context of uh, your Central Europe on the thought of you are not building a wall or... The, what, what you need is you need a meaningful involvement on the society and you need to inform the people, you need to tell them uh, what's happening. I remember when I started at the school, uh, forestry school in France, I mean, it's sort of, the first thing we were told is that we are the forester, we know. So you don't ask, you, you don't want any tourists, you don't want to, you keep the people as close as possible from the bench so that they don't go too deep in the forest. And, and you certainly don't ask if you need to cut something or not. And I think we need to pass by that, I mean, sort of, because otherwise we are not going to go very far. Thank, Thank you very much. Yes. Big applause for our panelists. Okay. Some little gifts. Yes. We have some gifts for them, for their hard work preparing for this session. But thank you very much, everyone, and thank you to our online audience. Thank you very much. Yes, and uh, one, just one information. Um, we will have coffee again now. Um, and then we will start at 4.30 with a parallel session. So enjoy your break. Thank you very much.